Today is December the 18th, 2021, and this is our Eastern Desiderata meeting. And uh, I just asked for Hugh if he can open up with um, his findings or anything he knows about the uh, new variant in regards to the to HIV. So, uh, and then we'll, we can go on from there. Yeah. Yeah, don't say the V word. It's uh, it's December the nineteenth oh. for us on oh. more easterly. Ah, from, gotcha. From but um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I I have I keep on looking. I haven't found anything, but uh, my spidey senses are still tingling as much as they were last week. Um, the, I just keep on getting this voice in the back of my head saying HIV, 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 because, um, uh, yeah, um. The, I think I told you all this the stuff about this Indian paper that came out right at the beginning. So there was amazing resemblance in the, the first variant to had amazing features that were similar to um, HIV. And if you look at the symptoms of this G variant, they they are the same as <laughs> as an HIV infection with the same time periods. It's, it looks identical, even down to you know mouth ulcers and stuff. And so it's like. I don't know, man. <laughs> if you had told me if I knew nothing else other than the symptoms and this thing came from Africa, I would say, "Uh oh, man, that's a that's a chimera right there." It's you know they. I uh, mentioned about how they they found um, <clears throat> well, they the press was speculating about, hey, you know, it's probably combined with a flu virus, and I'm like, it's a, it's just so western and so self indulgent and conceited to say like. Oh, the flu, because, you know, everybody knows that Africa is full of, uh, you know, a cold, you know, because because here's guys sniffling in London and they automatically assume because people are sniffling in London in winter. Oh, uh, you know, Africans must be doing that, too, in the middle of summer, because, you know, Africans are all sniveling with a cold like they do in England. <laughs> it's like you're fucking conceited assholes, man. It's just kind of the the cold isn't in Africa. <laughs> I'll tell you what's in Africa. There's HIV from fucking Cape to Cairo, every second person. And so it's just a perfect place for an immunocompromised person to incubate this this thing and that it's very likely to have features of um of HIV because it's merged with it. I mean, why it's it's so damned obvious. And I'm I'm looking at all the scholarly papers and stuff and just see more and more hints that there's, you know, they're components of HIV. And uh, no one's saying it. I can't find any academic or professional that's making this connection. And I'm just thinking, they all go and, you know, oh, you know, this is great news because it's going to, you know, it's it's not, you know, the symptoms are mild and it's going to tear around the world and replace the, replace the other variants. Okay, first of all, that is absolute fucking horseshit. The evidence is already in that, your past infection history has no bearing on whether you can get infected by this. In fact, you can get reinfected by this same variant. So it's like, we, you know, what is wrong with these fucking people? We cannot reach herd immunity. Therefore, all the measures that governments are taking are useless. They only make sense if you're trying to get to herd immunity. Or one thing is that you're trying to keep the hospitals, uh, you know, beds free. But, or keep the, you know, lower the pressure on the ICU units. But that doesn't make any sense in this case because you, you, it's going to, the doubling thing is about, it has an R value about six or something. So it's like, it's going around like measles. You, there's no ways you can do jabs against it in time. And that's the wrong fucking jabs. If anything, you're doing harm. You're basically priming people's immune system for the wrong variant. And then you have um, antigenic sin. It means that the T, T cells respond with the wrong fucking war. So it's just it's just absolutely insane. I think like how can everybody be this insane? Um, and so yeah, it's uh, you know so we're getting this message like oh this is good news. It's going to be the end of the pandemic. It's going to drive the others out. Why? Well, it takes a little broom and sweeps out the other variants. It does a little Darwinian race and says oh you know. I'm going to infect Mike. No, no, it's my chance to infect Mike. Oh, we'll have a little fight, shall we? And we just like come outside, you know? Like the variants don't do that, man. It's not a Darwinian race. You can be infected by five of them together, you moron. 
so they carry and then and then these people saying like you know all these mixed messages that all come down to the government is trying to make a second class citizen of pariahs from refuse refuse pricks and it's but it makes no sense because they're saying you know you you're irresponsible to the community but you know the, particularly with this over and it, it like it offers no protection i posted the things from denmark that it is a pandemic of the uh, of the fully uh, uh, okay so the fully uh, 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 are, are running around just about fucking you know with hate speech and fucking just about rounding people up and putting them in gas chambers and and he's saying like we just said that it's your it's you the problem because you you got a license from the government to to be a fool and so everybody's running around thinking they've got protection and presidents are saying yeah. we got protection you've got protection it protects you and saying you're a fucking liar and then the 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 press doesn't say oh he's a fucking liar they say oh it's a half truth it's a half truth if trump had said that you would have seen he would have been eviscerated but because it's biden now it's like Oh no, it's a half truth. You know, we, we always give him the benefit of the doubt. He fucking lied, and people are going to get fucking beaten up with this. This is gonna, this is going to have serious consequences and violence on the streets. But does the fact checkers or the left wing fucking media actually say anything about this? It's like no, they give him the benefit of the doubt. So it's just it's just fucking moronic this whole thing. And all I got to say to you is, I'm not I'm not a virologist. I'm not a doctor, but I am a I've seen this shit. I lived through this shit. I've, I've given up to trying to tell people that HIV was a bioweapon, was in, manufactured in a lab. Uh, and, and you know, so is this uh, thing from Wuhan. So it's like, guys, it's like, get over yourselves. It's like, you know, it, you've got to start believing in conspiracy theories. And it's, it's like, I, I re you see, if you grew up in South Africa like I did, you learn to get conspiratorial and paranoid. You have to, to survive because it's all lies and manipulation and it's dangerous shit. And so, and so, so you learn to be paranoid and conspiratorial. So, you know, I, I, that's the air you breathe if you grow up in a, something like apartheid, you can disappear in the night. And so, you know, when I came to the civilized world and I realized nobody did conspiracies, I was kind of shocked. Especially because they're saying, like, you know, of course you can see that there are conspiracies everywhere in these in these countries. That go and go and do yourself a favor. Go and look up Voter Basson and the Project Coast. You know, Voter Basson got off with a slap on the wrist, right? He didn't he he didn't confess up to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, okay, uh, which is what you needed to do to get indemnity. And still he got off. He hasn't been prosecuted today. That that's like Dr. Mengele of or you know, of getting off with nothing, not even a fine. Okay, so so it's like, how does that happen? There must have been some pretty heavy hitting phone calls to South Africa. Yeah. Oh, hi Petra. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Oh, hi, Petra? Is it Petra? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can hear you, Petra. I don't know if you can hear me. <clears throat> no, she dropped off again. She but, dropped off. <clears throat> so anyway, all I'm, all I'm saying to you is don't take medical advice from me. But, you know, it's just be a little bit cautious. How how much trouble does it take to get a false negative? If, if you're absolutely wrong and stuff, it doesn't really matter. What are you lost? Christmas? It's like, think of the fucking downside. You know, think of the fucking downside. If this is airborne HIV, think of what that means to the planet. It's just unthinkable. So if if you get HIV today, it's not an automatic death sentence. But but a pandemic of HIV, it's like it's very expensive drugs, very, very intensive on the healthcare system. It it would be a terrible, terrible thing for the world. And it's like 90% of people might get this variant. <clears throat> Imagine a year down the road where people start getting funny diseases and weird cancers and stuff. You're going to have a look at, you know, how London and New York and LA and stuff was wiped out by the AIDS epidemic in the eighties. And you know, all, the, all the gay community, you know, they were dropping like flies, all the clubs and everything, all the gay scene, just 
it's closed because the people died. I mean, if you think of that on a scale, it's just just a little bit of caution and just a little bit of less shit. I mean, can, does, does everything have to be political and everything have to be normalized so that there are no conspiracies? It's like, guys, this is my reading of the whole situation. They're doing bioweapons research all the fucking time, all over. The reason why they're not making a bigger song and dance out because they're all in it. It was bioweapons research or most dual use research in Wuhan. And it was with HIV too. And then, and so, and so it's most likely an accidental leak. But this, this variant could worry because the two are so similar, there could actually be a chimera of the two of them. Take it seriously. What's the harm? I, you know, I might cost you Christmas or something, but by, by the same token, right? This is what I'm worried about is they're getting more and more reckless. So they, 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 you know, they all say, oh, it was a miracle of how quickly they managed to test these drugs and say, don't be an idiot. They, they didn't do a miracle of compression of the testing cycle. They just fucking cut it out. They just fucking didn't do any testing. So it looks like they got lucky this once, but now that they've, so messenger RNA vaccines, they were destined for, it was at least 40 years before we are going to get this shit imposed on us, right? They cut 40 years off the development cycle of these fucking abominations. And this is technology is nanotechnology. And basically it means that they can sequence, they can come up with a sequence in the morning. They can produce it in the afternoon, literally with sequencing machines. And so, so what they're going to do with all these boosters, they effectively an entirely new V, right? The entirely new VX. And so everybody's going to rush out thinking, oh, it's a booster. It's like a variation on. No, it's something they came up with in the morning and they rushed out and manufactured. Basically, the, the manufacturing cycle is the, the bottleneck now. So you are literally a fucking guinea, guinea pig. So, so I'm just saying, you, you take something that's, uh, you know, what they're going to do is they try and do a mimic of some of the sequences. They don't know what those sequences are. If they, they don't know which one of those compromise your immune system and act like HIV. So they could quite easily roll out something that says, okay, this one works. Um, it reduces people's symptoms. Yeah, it also gives them fucking AIDS. So just, just fucking just be careful, guys. <laughs> just, just, I mean, at, at times like this, go and hide under a fucking rock. Don't argue, don't get political, don't talk to these. Everybody has a fucking weird motive of why you should get the jab, why you should, you know, why it's all right wing to be on TV and stuff. It's like, forget all that shit. Just be a fucking intelligent human being and realize this is one of the occasions where the world has gone fucking barking mad. And just do your best to stay out of it. Don't argue a point. You know, it's like, why did these people argue this point saying like, you know, like, it, so, you know, they just trying to get back to normalcy. It's all to do with psychology. It's got nothing to do with prudence. So just uh, be prudent, go hide under a rock if you can. Um, and just until this blows over, it's just, I don't know. Okay. So that's my little rant on that. Does anybody want to say anything? Well, well, I mean, does it blow over? Um, I don't know. Can you hear me now or not? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear yeah. Me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm just wondering what happens, uh, you know, whether you're perpetually stuck with some AIDS like arrangement in the environment. Um, I, well, I think this. Go on. Sorry. Only two outcomes, right? The, if you ask an immunologist, they'll tell you there are only two outcomes for something. So, so first of all, these things are new, right? There's, there's no, nothing in our history. I uh, was like HIV and these things that, you know, that uh, immunocompromised. These things hijack your immune system. It's diabolical. And I mean, on a biological time, if you just look at how they work, they're just fucking diabolical. They come straight from hell. The only way you can think up a thing like this is uh, if you, you know, with human intervention, these are artificial. And so, you know, it's saying like, well, that's new. But traditionally, if you get some, you know, something, some devastating disease that sweeps through populations, first of all, this only came about after the civilization, right? So hunter-gatherers didn't get pandemics. 
animals don't generally get pandemics unless there's some destabilization in the habitat, just like ours. So, so first of all, this isn't a disease of industrialization. It's saying it's uh, numbers are too dense. We're traveling too much. Uh, our lifestyles aren't healthy. That's the message the virus is trying to tell you. No one wants to get that message. They just want to know, how can we get back to the party? And so, so where these viruses normally go, traditionally, in during at least 10, for the last 10,000 years, is they become endemic or they wipe you out. So they don't wipe everybody out. They can't. They, eventually, you get back to hunter-gatherer numbers, and then you're safe again. So, so there's a de two destinies from this. It's like hunter-gatherer or an endemic. But they're not going anywhere. They are with us for keeps. And that's what the government needs to tell everybody. They need to stop the shit about boosters and all those fucking fairy tales and say, guys, get over it. This is, and it has to basically get endemic or we will die. Those are the only two outcomes. You just learn to fucking live with it. Adjust your lifestyle. And then no one wants to adjust their lifestyle. They're using all these Vs and jabs as an excuse to keep their lifestyles. Your lifestyle has gone, right? They, well, however you lived before 2020, no one in the history of this planet in the future is is going to live like that ever, ever fucking again, especially all the fucking little liberals running around <laughs> with their sanctimonious fucking politics and wokeness. That life has gone. It's gone two years ago. Catch up for fuck's sake. It's not coming back. Not a single sliver of it. So what the government needs to tell people this. And needs to stop waving all these uh, false hopes and lucky rabbit foot and stuff. All it is is a narrative for the government to get the economy going again. The government doesn't care about you, doesn't care about your health. It cares about the economy. It cares about GDP growth and productivity. They do not look at the statistics for hospitalization more than two seconds. They're looking at a spreadsheet with production figures. They are, they are basing this on production, not on all the shit you look at because you're worried about your health. So there are a couple of ep epidemiologists that have their heads up their ass, and they they say one thing about you know all about medicine. The politicians give scant regard to that. All they're doing is looking at GDP, GDP growth. It's all. That's the figure they're pursuing. So they will do anything to pursue that. They will say anything. They will lie. They will risk your health. They will do any fucking thing. They will go to war to keep productivity up. Just, just remember that, okay? Just get some perspective, for fuck's sake. But anyway, sorry, um, Gary. Yeah, I just was thinking because I was looking uh, at the um, situation here, uh, looking at the figures yesterday, and um, the, 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 what they seem to be doing is contradictory because uh, um, we had a lockdown for a very long time, for three months, and uh, their case numbers per day for this state got up to over 2,000 uh, at the peak. And then it fell back quite a bit and then the lockdown ended. Uh, and it's taken about six weeks or so and the case numbers have now come up to about the same amount again, up to about 2,200 yesterday it was. Um, uh, a very, very small percentage of that is the new variant. Um, but they seem to be pursuing a, a policy that, I, I don't know, I thought it was contradictory, that there's not very many restrictions now, uh, except if you test uh, positive, you're going to be isolated. Um, and um, I think they're going to run into trouble with that very, very quickly because as the, the new variant um multiplies, which is obviously is going to happen very quickly, if, if they just keep isolating people on the basis of cases, uh, you're not going to have a workforce within the next couple of months. So they seem to be pursuing a course that's going to lead them to uh, what, what, what you GDP damage. So I can't understand it uh, exactly, you know, whether there's going to have to be a sudden shift in attitude. Um, so I, I don't know. I just felt it was contradictory. That's all. 
it, it is contradictory. They're flailing. Um, so they're doing stuff like none of the stuff they do makes makes any sense. They're just trying to give a semblance of being in control. So there's there's uh, they're pursuing uh, tactics that you pursue at the stage where you can still do containment. So they they're pretending that we're still at the very early stages where you can actually do contact tracing and and containment and stuff. We're way past that. You can forget about that strategy. But then, so then you, what do they move on to? Well, then we're at the, the, the herd immunity stage. That's the next stage. But we've heard very early on, we heard you cannot get herd immunity from this. So where does that leave us? That leaves us at the totally fucked stage. And they, they just don't want to come out and say, look, guys, we're fucked. So they carry on with all these kabuki dancers. I mean, all these things like, you know, the, the testing and border controls. There's no, you know, they they keep on, you know, putting restrictions on flights and borders and stuff. Look, they should stop flights or shut up. You can't just set, have restrictions and tests and all these, you know, it's just xenophobia for people coming abroad. You know, if you go to Britain, you have to do a sec two day test and an eight day test and a test before you go and a test. It's like, why? You've got the fucking disease and plenty. It's like trying to stop ice coming to Iceland. It's like. You know, it's like, it makes no sense. You might as well put a barrier down Oxford Street and say, if anybody crosses over from the left side of Oxford Street to the right side, oh, they must be tested three times and stuff. Why? Everybody on the left of Oxford Street and on the right of Oxford Street has the fucking disease. So an airport does nothing. It's, it's, you just see how fucking screwed up these people are and the, the idea of borders and statehood and xenophobia against Africa and stuff. And they're saying like, no, these are all political boundaries that have no, the, the virus doesn't give a shit about them. And then on top of that, they, they're clearly lying about one crucial thing. Um, and that is that I think that it's probably spreading in packaging. So, so they, they, they've absolutely roundly say now, like, oh, no, we all established that it doesn't spread in packaging horseshit. In the, in the early days, I read a few papers, with, particularly out of guys from China. They said that basically a frozen package, something like frozen meats and stuff like that, is perfect, perfect uh, environment to preserve the, this disease for over three months. So it's like, it's obvious. Amazon is bringing this thing to your door, and they don't want you to know that because it affects the economy. So, so, they, so basically the reason why they want GDP growth is because they just care about getting elected. And, and GDP growth is the one thing that helps them get elected. So, so the next thing is some horror story like you know, body bags building outside, up outside the emergency. So that, that's, the, that's the next thing they care about. So they'll pursue all these madcap kind of strategies because they just don't want to see bad headlines on their watch because they know they're not going to get elected. If you look at Biden's um, approval ratings now, they flew they through the floor. And so that, the reason is because he's not being a good daddy and a good shepherd to the flock. And so, you know, they, they have, that's part of the social contract is we will protect you from the, you know, the unprotectable. And, uh, and so then they have to keep those, those bad headlines up. But that's that's all that's going on. Just don't, just don't assume that they're doing anything for you or your health. It's like that's the last thing they care about. No, but isn't there also the parallel agenda of uh, the fact that it's been a very convenient way to increase control, um, and having got hold of it, uh, they want to maintain that. You know, you, it's not hard to think that a lot of the uh, restrictions that are here, which aren't doing anything uh, there as an authoritarian exercise. Not quite, because they've, as far as I've seen and the insights that I've got, is they always knew they had this control. They just, uh, they, they always uh, planned to execute it in an emergency. So if you look at all the FEMA plans and the disaster management plans, they, they all is, have this arrogant assumption of authority in them. I mean, totalitarian authority, like super scary shit. And so that's always been written into their plans. So they've, they've, as far as I can see in their psychology, they have this idea that they have absolutely supreme power. They give uh, 
uh, some semblance of democracy and free speech just in peacetime, just as a little fob. But, you know, they know full well that what they can, you see, they've been through wars and stuff. They know they know what you can do and what you can't do. And it's like they can do fucking anything. People are just sheep. I mean, you, you, you're just Jews in Nazi Germany, right? It, it's like everybody's saying, like, but, you know, we have to, you know, they can't do that because the Jews would outvote them. It's like, really? The Jews are going to outvote the Nazis? <laughs> Come on. Your government is totalitarian. I mean, everybody, Australia, UK, US, they uh, absolute totalitarian. They just Sam, they just water it down a bit in peacetime. But as soon as we get back to the real shit and the grind, they, they will take the blinders off. So they're not training people or anything like that. They, they can just send a squad with armed guys running down the street and a megaphone and say, get in your house and people will scurry. So they know that they don't. They're not learning anything out of this. They they just uh, they just they're just um, trying to be as light-handed as possible. I'm just wondering whether uh, they are sort of getting people accustomed to that kind of treatment, or whether they just don't care about that. No, that's kind of the case I'm making. Is they just don't care. Mm. You see, they, you see mm. what. They, they, uh, the psychology is very well established. They've done they all through the 50s in uh, MK Ultra and all of these things, and just, especially during the Korean War, there was a lot of stuff done in psychology and how much you can control people. All the Mil Milgram experiments, all of that were part of this. And they all realized, fucking hell, you can do anything with people. That, that's the, the, the biting thing that comes echoing down from all those studies is, Jesus Christ, we never knew this. You could do anything to anybody and they don't even bleed. And that, so they don't need to train people. They don't it's, uh, condition people or something. What they do is shock and awe. So, so what they established was if you shock people, then you can do anything afterwards. So if you, uh, you know, basically it's almost literally like giving people a taser. So if, if you just do a big spectacular, everybody's babbling and, you know, running around crazy. Uh, then you can do anything in the wake of that. So, and it's so easy to initiate a crisis. And that, so they, they do a shock doctrine. They literally call it a shock doctrine. They do it in finance. They, they do it, you know, all over. To whatever they want to do. 9-11. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all of that stuff. It's a shock doctrine. And so, so basically, you know, expect the next shock sometime. You know, they, will, they will do, it depends what they want to do. And it's clear what they want to do. They want to go to war with China. So it's like, okay, just put, how do you go to war with China? Just It's very easy to put yourself in these guys' sandals. They're not very bright. They're about as bright as Pompeo. They, they're very, very predictable like Pompeo. I, I, I mean, just think of Pompeo all the time. Just think, what would Pompeo do? Like, like you normally think, what would Jesus do? do you think, like, what would Pompeo do? It's very easy. They're very predictable. We, we're the top dog, and we got to stop this Chinese dog getting, you know, taking over our pitch. So it's like, how do we do this? Well, we got to blow them away before they basically get supremacy over us. Okay, how do we do it? Fill in the blanks. You just shock the population into the necessity to go to war with them. So they, they're lining those ducks up or every single day, and nobody's noticing. People are saying, like, I don't think we're going to war. Why? Oh, my normalcy bias tells me that. My normalcy bias tells me that things are going to get back to normal. Why? Because I, I believe in wishful thinking and not what my eyes are telling me. And I, that's, a, that's a constant. Is there uh, any um, uh, uh, anything to be said for the argument that, you know, uh, you can use the shock tactic too many times and people become, uh, they just don't respond after a while? you know, uh, or they don't respond yeah. as strongly. Yes, that was experiments they did with dogs, uh, and they called it's called learned helplessness. So what, what they found is if you give people enough shocks, then they, they just uh, become kind of attenuated, muted responses, utterly obedient. They just crumble. And so a lot of people, a percentage of the population, some small percentage of the population is already getting that way. So uh, the, uh, 
you'll get suicides, you'll get you'll get people just giving up, just just in total defeat. And that's um, the the only problem for the elite is that is that people don't last long after they get so if you go and look in the in the death camps and stuff in like Auschwitz, they had a name for for people that got into that state, and they all knew that if you get into that state of hopelessness, you, you only got like a month to go. You're kind of on the on the home stretch, and so that's uh, yeah. You, they don't they don't want to get masses of people into learned helplessness, but uh, just just shocking the sheep now and again, just just a cattle prod, right? Like a farmer. You know? Um. This is what I, what I was thinking, though. I mean, there's a certain amount of this has already gone on with the uh, pseudo-pandemic, I guess. Uh, but um, you're going to get a... Aren't we going to get a lot of these environmental shocks rather upsetting their plan by introducing more shocks that that uh, then, then are being deliberately manufactured? So you know, I mean, there's there's always the chance that the environmental collapse c could uh, derail all sorts of plans anyway. But uh, I'm just thinking particularly here of of just ongoing um, assaults on people's sensibility by uh, well, you know, we've only got to look at what's happening in the United States at the moment, um, which seems to be a year on year thing now, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm just kind of wondering whether that will, will you know, upset the uh, the normal sequence of events towards war with China or, or anything else that might be planned. Yeah, this is what they're planning for, is, is that, that uh, the, the disasters come thick and fast. Um, and and they, their only narrative is control. So it's like, how, how do you keep control when everything's disintegrating around you? And the, they, the standard way is they just, they just get more authoritarian. So, the, yeah, I mean, the, what happens is everybody goes into an escape mode. You know, they try and get escape. So some people escape into drugs and alcohol. Some people escape into religion and cults and, you know, um, yeah, stuff like the flippening is ready made for people <laughs> to get escape. Um, and so uh, and some people escape into headers and anything that, that gives them pain relief. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, it's, it's a mass psychosis. Um, so it's like, it's a mass psychosis that you don't want to take part in because there's, uh, sure, there's a trans transformation, but I think this transformation out of this one is, is pyrrhic. I think it's like you you want to go through your own psychological transformation. You want to go through eusychosis. What they're going through is malpsychosis followed by extinction. So it's it, you want to go through eusychosis followed followed by survival. And so that's what I'm trying to tell people <laughs> about. So even if I'm absolutely completely wrong about the flipping, it doesn't really matter. It is the it is the way you should be thinking. If the flipping wasn't true, it would be good to invent it, because it, it's the standard fare of any um, apocalyptic kind of salvationism. It, it's the, the bread and butter of early Christianity, early Mithraism, early everything. Um, so you know the the problem is that it's it's pure people's temple stuff. You see, if you, it's well worth looking at the people's temple and how, where they got to. And uh, you don't want to go down that path. But the problem is you can't really avoid it. You have, to, you have to go down that path and know how to survive it. So in other words, you can't avoid this test. You have to you know, thread the needle and survive it. So the, one of the, the greatest th the problems, I think, is people thinking they, they can avoid it. So every, everybody says to me, they're all on about, uh, all the DMs I get and stuff is, stuff is how can I avoid it? And it's, it's, it's tough because the very part of your brain, the alien cortex, that's saying, how can I survive? You say, you have to say, like, you cannot. 
Okay, wherever we're going, the alien cortex it doesn't get there. So this is kind of what we're saying to Sophie in the last Sunday. I don't think that point got across. So well, how, how do you know the alien cortex doesn't? How, how do you know people don't recreate this civilization? It's like, it's impossible. It's, the alien cortex can't get through this, this filter. This, this is the great filter. And so, so, I mean, just think about it, just to, to ground it in some reality is imagine Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is, is a, a guy with lots of resources who from, from the cradle is probably, probably from about the age of four, I'd expect he, he got the idea that the world is hostile and you have to be an arsehole to make it. Uh, he's a bit of a runt of the litter. So he's going to have to use his, his noggin to, you know, beat out all the hostile forces in the world. Huge in the in dot com and then uh, now he's got the resources to survive now he's mr chess playing alien cortex right this man is not going to survive why because think what he's going to do he's going to be kind of a psychopathic my version of uh, of pompeo so he, he he probably knows about the flipping and he's probably going to try and do it by hanging out in space and he'll probably survive and what will happen when he comes down to earth it, he'll be fucking slaughtered <laughs> if you, yeah it's have you ever read the admirable Crichton? Uh, i've heard what about, about it. it's ian foster isn't it um yeah so yeah, you, you, you did mention it a long time ago no yeah. it's, it's well, yeah, for people that don't know, it's it's one of these stories a bit like Lord of the Flies, and it's it's one of these things a bit like we were saying about, um, you know, how like a king I dined in the Robinson Crusoe. It's Swiss Family Robinson. There, there was an era where these people thought, can you bug out of civilization and, uh, and get back to paradise? Everything from Gauguin, all of these guys, a long history during the Industrial Revolution. So, so... The Admirable Crichton was one of these. It was for aristocrats in England. And it was, it was, you know, kind of the H.G. Wells' time machine was the exact thing. And Eli, you know, Morlocks and Eloy. And so this book was written for the Eloy, written for the XR, <laughs> the young XR guys, um, all the precious little dandies and effete little dilettantes in XR that, you know, like their Christmas message thing just makes you want a puke. So it's basically for those puke-worthy types that thought they were superior because you know they they put them on you know the social system put them at the top, and then they all you wondered in their dark you know Mary Shelley and nightmare is what would happen if I was really put to the test if all the people that served me dinner um, if I had to compete with them or you know we all wound up where we didn't have the army and the soldiery to protect us in our you know Downton Abbey. And so the, the book there was, was the, the normal fair where rich fuck and butler uh, and entourage uh, get shipwrecked, wind up on an island. And then, of course, you know, the lord of the manor, Mr. Haw Haw, doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't shape because he's, he, what, what does he do? He can't even tie his own shoelaces. You know, I, I had one of these ancestors about, but one of my, we had, we've got family stories of my, my great grandfather and my my father told me that yeah he he got under in stress he became a distressed gentleman lost all his estates and for a while he had to come and live with my dad and his family when my dad was a kid and he came to them and he said like um i need a new toothbrush and you know all of his toothbrush and they said uh, why? What's uh, it, it doesn't look that bad and he, said, he said no no it um, it doesn't foam anymore and after a bit of questioning, they realized for the first time in his entire life since he was out of diapers, and he didn't know that every time his Batman handed him his toothbrush, he actually dipped it in the tooth powder first and then handed it. He thought that there was some magic in the toothbrush that made it foam. And so you took away his Batman, he couldn't even brush his fucking teeth. Now, this is what the admirable Crichton is about, is Crichton is that butler who now they they all rely on because the butler can do shit. Uh, he's like he's like MacGyver. And the Lord can't even tie his own fucking shoelaces. Literally. I don't think there I think there are many, many 
English gentlemen that couldn't tie an Oxford tie or tie their fucking shoelaces because it was done for them by a Batman. And so, you know, this is the horror of the Eloy is like, ah, oh, is it possible that we're not all that well bred or we're actually inbred and we're actually incapable and all these other, you know, Morlocks that serve us are actually the ones that will survive if uh, things go a bit monkey. And so that was the, the whole terror. And that was the, so then, you know, spoiler alert, the admirable crime. And Crichton becomes the big chief. The, the butler becomes the big chief because he can do shit while they're on the island. Eventually, when the um, you know they get rescued, then it immediately reverts back to type. And then the Lord who goes like, oh, well, you know, put my things on the ship now, Crichton. And so Crichton goes from becoming the big king to being a butler again. And uh, yeah. so anyway, the, the whole point of this, um, this, this story is that, uh, you know, you... It is, um, it is a test of whether you can be Crichton, because Crichton survives, right? Was that, or where did we start off on that little tangent? That was. It? Are you muted? Sorry, I'm just looking because we were talking about this. Uh, Fati shock fatigue effects, um, ear psychosis, the great filter of the alien cortex. I don't know. You oh, must have taken oh, a bit oh, of a leap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It, it was about why the alien cortex cannot survive. Mm. Okay. So so then, yeah. So, so Jeff Bezos is Lord Haw or whatever the guy's name is in the Admiral mm. Crichton. So if Jeff Bezos comes down, you know, off his spaceship and say like, okay, now we have to survive the nuclear winter. Um, he's, uh, he's going to get an axe in the head because, uh, Crichton and these guys just don't need him. I mean, he's, he's utterly superfluous and he's an arrogant twat. Yeah, um, yeah. you see, uh, Amazon and Amazon web services and stuff, they're in Seattle and I know a lot of guys actually work there. And so these, these guys have this, it's a cult. It's, it's Jeff Bezos's cult. And, and if you uh, talk to them, they all work to death. They actually have a, a mantra of we must be more robot. We must be more machine. We must be literally, literally, they think that this is some kind of virtue being a machine. Why? Because their cult leader told them that because he wants machines. He doesn't want people unpredictable. He doesn't want equals. He doesn't want rivals. He wants people to do his bidding. And so it's like, imagine that. Uh, in an environment where people can just walk up behind you and just put an axe in your head and there's zero consequence. How long do those guys survive? It's by, basically, I've seen it with my own eyes. If, if you, When you get into trouble, and if those guys last seconds. So the only thing that's, that's keeping, propping up our entire system, all these rich fucks that everybody lords and stuff like that, the, they, they are hanging on a thread. The only thread that keeps them hanging on is the police. It's the police and the courts. That's it. If, if the police and the courts disappear, those guys are, are dogs me. I mean, I would happily feed them to one of my dogs. So, <laughs> so it's like, the thin blue line. It's like, yeah. The thin blue it's, line. It, it, and it is so, so thin. I mean, you see, everybody thinks these guys are invulnerable because they think our society is invulnerable. But look at, uh, look at Musk. I mean, I really feel sorry for for us because he's he's. I think uh, him and Zuck. I mean, they moments away from a stock market crash where they back to rags, and nobody sees it. It's like the richest man that's ever been. It's also absolutely paper thin. It's 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 basically a Ponzi scheme that will unravel in days, and everybody will be shocked and amazed and stuff because they think, you know. How can that happen? Uh, I thought if I made it to be king of the castle, uh, I was in, enshrined on the right hand of God for all eternity. No, you're there for about three minutes and then fucking four. So it's it's really, it's, you know, easy come, easy go. And these guys had a very easy come fortune. So it's like everybody thinks that they're durable and they're not. They, they're absolutely built on sand. So, you know, they're... Uh, it's another way of saying the alien cortex cannot get through this adversity. It cannot. And you can just go back, ask an anthropologist. <coughs> ask an anthropologist. If you're strategic, if you're gaming, 
if you're not very trustworthy, if you're a liar, and you go and live in an indigenous population, they will they will axe you. I mean, literally, in 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 days. Yeah, uh, that came out in that short story that I um, uh, posted about a fair while ago called um, And Then There Were None uh, about a uh, kind of anarchist society. And uh, uh, part of that story was what happened to people who just uh, gained the system, you know, how they would just be excluded uh until they couldn't survive, at least. It was an interesting portrayal. Well, wasn't that an Agatha Christie one? Wasn't no, that Agatha Christie uh, one where all on the own? No, this was a science fiction one. I'll think of the guy's name in a minute. The name of the story is And Then There Were None. That's a 1950s um, science fiction short story. Um, and uh, it, it was quite interesting portrayal of an anarchist society. Uh, and also possibly the way a tribal society would work, but it was set. It was given a science fiction setting. Um, what I wanted to ask you was uh, just where you were talking about the flippening, having this quality of not giving the alien cortex an escape route. Um, but if, uh, you know, we pursue the path we're on at the moment where authoritarianism keeps getting ramped up, to the point where it reaches a screaming fever pitch. Um, uh, you know, that could that have the same effect? Because, you know, once people realise that this is just totally dominant, um, it's all powerful and they have no escape, that the actual increase in authoritarianism could... Uh, would you see that under any circumstances leading to eupsychosis? Yes, it, it did in South Africa. So, you know, that was the story of South Africa and eventually got to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where everybody discovered their humanity and the alien cortex was vanquished. But the problem is it didn't, <laughs> like all these things, it doesn't, it's not permanent because it doesn't matter if you, it's, it's like you can't have one same in person in the corner of the lunatic asylum so, so south africa got sane um and then it's it's like all that means is okay now your job expands now you've got to expand to the rest of the world so south africans went out and tried to you know spread the sanity but you know you, it's easy to get well it's fucking difficult in fact to get sane in one corner of the asylum but immediately if you achieve that miracle then you, your task is 10 times bigger and you have to get the next 10 inmates and get them sane. But the, but you see, it's, it's, uh, you, you can't just have one sane country or one sane person and stuff. But by definition, a sane person in an insane, uh, insane society is insane. You know? And in our society, they will They're basically the power brokers, people like psychiatrists and family heads of family and stuff. They will use their power to uh, to stop anybody behaving like a shaman and transforming them. So the, the vast majority of people, schizophrenics and things like that, that wind up in clinics, they wind up there because uh, they schizophrenics don't go to doctors. They, they wind up there because power figures, uh, people in, uh, in you know, heads of uh, colleges or heads of families or something, people that have a vested interest in maintaining the power structure, they bring them to clinicians. And what they're doing is they're saying, like, this one is a problem one. Please fucking use your superior authority to get them, get them under control. And so they, they, uh, they transfer their insanity onto uh, effectively the schizophrenic scapegoat and this and the psychiatrists uh, authority that you know society gives them uh they then use them to to control and box up the schizophrenic and they're, they're what they they're doing is so that they don't have to change they basically they use, use the schizophrenic as a sacrifice 
so that they don't change. In the old days, they valued the the schizophrenic, call him a shaman, and then you, you know they they would respond to the shaman and change. But we got to the stage where the alien cortex reached this supreme you know hegemony, and and now it just pathologizes anybody that's anti-alien cortex to the point where we can just say, well, that's not rational, and that means that you ought to be put on the you know, on the altar and sacrificed like a goat. Why? Because you're not rational. Because they're like, rationality you, is a disease. It's it look what rationality is doing to us. It's making us go extinct. I seem to remember some time back you you uh, mentioned like what proportion of people would have to be genuinely sane to prevent uh, the mal the the kind of alien cortex from coming back, from dominating again. Like, I, I don't know, what, what you said, like 80% of a, a group would need to be not dominated by the alien cortex in, in order to stop it from coming back to a dominating position in, in the society. Um, have you got anything to say there? Well, it's, it's different. See, it's a, it's a scale-free network, right? So it's a mesh network. And you have these preferential nodes. So it, it's very important about which node. So 80% is, is um, you see, the 80%, you can get to it quite easily. It's not that, oh, you have a huge task. You have to go one by one. And, you know, thinking linearly, you must make 80% of people sane. It's not quite like that at all. The net result is that. But you can get the number of ways. One of them is you can take a preferential node. The preferential node then if if some great influencer in the world got sane, they could propagate sanity to 80% virtually instantly. The other way is the environment. The reason why we have the, the alien cortex and why it survives is most people are not, you know, driven by the alien cortex. Only about one in 20, you know, they're semi-psychopathic, right? So they they the, you know, the wealth creates guys that, you know, basically the Jeff Bezos and stuff, but that, you know, most people are sane. They, they will sit around in the sun fucking and drinking beer and generally behaving like hunter gatherers, which is uh, how we're supposed to be. Um, about one in 20 people gets everybody, you know, running to raid the other guys or raid the other tribe or doing some fucking tower of Babel or getting to the moon. It's, it's some kind of Kennedy one, right? So, so the, you know, those are the, the sick people. And they, they um, uh, you know, they, they thrive because we've, we got into this feedback loop where they, the alien cortex created civilization as a niche where it survived best. So it's, it survives because of the habitat it created, the niche habitat it created. Now, if you take civilization away, um, people instantly will revert back to type, which is not alien cortex. And so you can get that 80% back again just by removing society. So again, that's why you can't, they won't recreate IDA because the resources are gone, the oil is gone, and all of the fossil fuels that make the society. But, but uh, you know, why, uh, they, they, they half used up and the other, the other half that you couldn't get to if you had a standing start as a hunter-gatherer, they're inaccessible, which is good. So so this era is well and truly over as any way you look at it. No one's going to invent cold fusion or f any fusion. <laughs> um, you know, nuclear stuff will... The Earth is going to flip long before you, people roll out nuclear programs, even though India's starting one now. But, you know, basically the... There's no way the alien cortex uh, can maintain its niche. So its niche is very exotic uh, and fragile. So civilization is exotic, fragile, and going away soon. It's um, it was based on oil. So 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 people don't really understand that. They think uh, they think linearly because alien cortex, and so they're thinking of this you know, fa fantastic future and this, you know, futurology and Ray Kurzweil and the singularity and stuff. And it's like, that is guaranteed. There are very few things you can guarantee in life, but that's one of them, that that will not happen. And so, you know, just do the fucking maths. But the, the uh, yeah, the, but the, the end result is what I'm saying is 
you don't have to laboriously go and make 80% of people rational. People are people are behaving irrationally because that's expected by by the culture and the the habitat but i mean you you can take somebody out of the city um stick them on a mountaintop and breathe some fresh air and hike around and uh, get their own food they they can go from a you know a drug addict you know pimp or whatever to being a normal hunter gatherer in a day uh, because you just just take them out of that environment so, but you see, what's we reinforcing that environment by, you know, if if somebody is a pimp or drug dealer or something like that, then we we double down, we put them in in a prison, and inside that cage, you know, that's a university for the alien cortex, and it comes out that you know much more pathological once it's been through the University of San Quentin, and so the uh, so you know we we are we are making the the environment. Uh, the, the alien cortex is manufacturing its own best environment. But just like a bacteria in a vat, it, it's also poisoning itself. So the very thing that makes the alien cortex is slowly polluting and poisoning its environment so it becomes un, untenable. So, so either way, you can't, you can't get there. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. No, that's good. Um, I just wanted to go back at some point there. It seemed worthwhile to, uh, because you were talking about GDP and that kind of thing, I was just thinking about recent news um, of China and Russia trying to dump the petrodollar and also Turkey now, um, Turkey's um, currency becoming, you know, essentially worthless. You, you, I think you posted some things about that. Um, are there, are there, is there anything you've got in mind there that, that's uh, yeah, worth this talking is, about? This is crucially, crucially dangerous stage. You see, uh, for the last uh, maybe two decades, um, but particularly the last decade, uh, everybody has been in this quiet trade war and currency war. Now, it's gone largely unnoticed, except if you're a central banker or politician or something. What, what they're all trying to do is, uh, is trying to devalue their currency to make, uh, make themselves competitive. So it's really a game that China started because China did a peg against the dollar. It's basically it's uh, against the WTO. It's against the trade rules. And it's very easy to to mechanize your country and raise the standard of living. All you do is you devalue your currency. If you devalue your currency, it means you can export, and it means that your population can't import. So, you know, if you're in China, it means you have to work like a dog. You have to, everything you, 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 you produce has to be sent overseas. Uh, China then gets a currency influx. Uh, a balance of payments deficit with whoever they're shipping their crap to. And if you're Chinese, you can't afford Louis Vuitton and um, Yves Saint Laurent and stuff like that. You you can't afford a, a luxury goods or any goods that are manufactured in the outside. And so that's an easy trick. And that's what China pulled. It's basically what goes back to Deng Xiaoping and these, these guys. And so they said like, okay, we are going to make 1.4 billion people into a and then we're going to go back to communism. So we, we first going to, we, you know, they saw the Soviet Union collapse, right? So they realized, okay, we can't do communism because uh, the, the economy falls apart. So it's like, okay, so what we're going to do is luxury commun communism. We're going to make, give all our workers a huge standard of living and then do communism. New, new plan. So then they say, like, okay, now we have done shopping. And then it's like, okay, how do we do this? Is the easiest way since the, you know, since uh, Ricardo and, um, and uh, the, the other fraud, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, damn it, I can't remember. His name is uh, the Invisible Hand and all that shit. So anyway, ever since then, the mercantilists will tell you that all you have to do is devalue your country. So they did it. They did a peg against the dollar. And immediately, you know, um, they have a massive uh, uh, 
balance of trade deficit um, or surplus, in if you look at it from the Chinese point of view. Um, what they did with that surplus is just buy treasuries in the in the states, and so so America didn't mind because they kept the American Ponzi scheme going. Um, but both sides know that where this is going to end up, and it ends up in war. But they, neither side minds because the 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 Chinese are thinking, well, look, we're going to accumulate all the chips on our on our table, and then we're going to be rich, we're going to be powerful, and then you know we're, we're going to do this before they manage to shoot us through the head. And the Americans on the other side of the table are watching all their chips flying over the table to the Chinese, and they're going like, we don't care. We've got a fucking six shooter right there on the fucking table. And as soon as this little yellow cunt gets all the chips, we shoot him through the head and take all the chips back. And so that's, you know, they're playing this game of, uh, of poker with very serious high consequences. So this is what's been going, going on uh, for the last two decades. And then uh, there's a very easy trick now. So what, what the whole world has been doing is this, this um, currency war, this very quiet currency war. Everybody's been trying to devalue their currency so they can keep up with China. They're all trying to do this race to the bottom. Well, since it's all relative, if everybody devalues their currency, everything stays the same. And so that all it does is pressure workers and their, their wages. So everybody's devaluing, devaluing, devaluing and saying like, where, where does this stop? Well, it's, there's a very easy trick. And that is, you can just go full on Zimbabwe dollar. So if you like Erdogan or something, you can just uh, make your currency worthless and start with the new one. And so then, then you've got ahead of everybody. So if, if somebody pulls that game, more and more people will have to do it. And so that's clearly what, the, you know, Schwab and all of these guys have seen this coming, and that's what the financial great reset is. Is like we we cannot you know devalue and inflate our currencies anymore. We just start with a new one, and then then we have a new game. And that's why people say, "Oh, we're going to go for crypto." We're not going to go for crypto. They'll just they'll just start a new currency that's basically centralized with them. So they will have something like the bank core or the the. Um, they'll probably have two currencies. One of, one of them is, um, uh, you know, the SDR, like special drawing rights that, that governments will use. And then, you know, we'll get a, a crap currency that's entirely digital. Uh, they'll they'll de-dollarize. And then whatever the new dollar is, will you know, they, they will, it'll come with lots of strings attached. So, so to get your hands on that new dollar, you, you will have to have micro control. So you've got a lot of leeway about how you, you earn dollars. You can do criminal activity and stuff and, and, and earn dollars. Once it's, once it's digital um, and they've, um, they've completely uh, digitized all the currencies, then, then there's no escape. You can't do anything illegal because they'll be able to track you and just cut you off, right? You, you won't be able to spend a dollar as a hooker, right? So if you, you won't be able to get a hooker with a digital currency because basically they, they will see that transaction and then basically you, they will prosecute you. You will be on a reform program. You'll be in Allison's world where they you know, have uh, impact tokens. They will monetize you as a, as a rogue agent and uh, change your behavior. So they'll do behavior modification for cash, um, all very lucrative. Um, and so it's utterly totalitarian. Uh, so that, that's, that's where, where we've headed. That's where we're headed. In the, in the meantime, the, the wrinkles, one of the, the wrinkles is they have to separate all the chipsets, right? They have to, so, so that uh, yeah, there have been too many people putting Trojan horses and other people's electronics. Um, basically, the, the Chinese into telcos and drones and stuff like that, and uh, Intel and all the other criminals into phones and uh, CPUs and stuff, and GPUs and stuff. So, so once they get all the chipset separated and they're both confident they have a reasonably clean chipset, then they can go to war. So it's, we must be a couple of years away. But you see, they, they have to go to war. Uh, America has to go to war. The, there's this closing window where uh, it'll, it'll be too late. China will be able to take too much of a toll. It'll be a, more of a, you know, they, they have a line that's essentially mutually assured dis destruction. So they're not there yet. America has supremacy can, and can destroy China. 
China can't destroy America, but is trying to get there. So uh, a coalition between Iran, Russia, and China doesn't get them to that line of mutually assured destruction. Um, but they're approaching it, and America has to shoot them through the head before they get there. And so that's that's what's happening. And so the uh, de-dollarization is, um, and demonetization is the is one of the the steps on the way there but th this by the way in case you think this is all bad news and stuff it's, it's the best news you've ever heard in your life um we we the the you should the day world war three breaks out you should celebrate it, it is very very beneficial for everybody <laughs> It'll be a bit of a meat cry. See, basically, as a, what kind of war it would be. So, okay, we're putting all of this under the heading of uh, the, the stages that you need to do to survive the flippening. The first one is you need to survive the collapse of the global industrial system, which, which comes first, probably. Although the flip could happen anytime, um, what's liable to happen is, you know, if, you, if you're going to make it through this challenge, this is the first hurdle, is making it through all the madness, you know, and... The, the pandemic is just the tip of the iceberg. The shit's coming now is much more challenging. Um, and and again, you cannot opt out. You cannot go to the mountains. You, you can't put your head in the sand. It's just, it's just not a viable strategy. You've got to be right in it, and you have to survive. You, you have to sit this test out and ride it, and you have to pass it and ace it. And so it's like you don't, you don't get to, to shirk this one. And so anyway, what's the the war is liable to be like is is well i'm afraid america is going to lose it because america has set themselves up where they have to win a war very quickly they have to i mean literally days right they they have to do um essentially iraq again um we're talking about masses of emps and stuff like that but they have to win the war and particularly the cyber war uh with you know, if if it's if if it runs into three weeks, they're done. They've utterly lost, right? So they have to do a blitzkrieg. Um, the the Chinese, on the other hand, uh, have uh, a huge uh, expendable army, and they they have to make it into a meat grinder war. So they they have to drag the thing out and make it turn it into a muddy trench war. So that that's what the the two are trying to do. Um, and so, you know, basically, if if uh, if the war draw, draws out too much, China's won. Um, but you know, imagine how imagine the landscape where it gets to to victory. It's basically years and years of grind. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I would expect it to start in proxy wars. I mean, the proxy wars with Iran is is coming. The the Ukraine, Taiwan, and stuff. But they, all of this is very good news. You see, what people will not notice is all the bullshit that's really dangerous, like them doing building nuclear power stations and doing big infrastructure builds and all of that stuff is, is becoming untenable while, while a war goes on. So a war is great, great news. You, you, want, to, you want to stay out of the army. <laughs> you, you definitely don't want to wind up in a draft. It's every all of them have too many people, um, and uh, too many young people. So as, as soon as the young start getting a little bolshy, which is already happening, uh, they, there's a lot of pressure on politicians to start a draft because you can just clean up the streets instantly with a draft. So you you start off with a draconian thing like, uh, you know, the police crimes bill. And when people eventually start saying, fuck the police crimes bill, uh, then you just start a draft. You just draft them and take them overseas. And so uh, so it's it's in all the totalitarian and government interests to start this this war and um, and keep control by clearing cleaning up the streets. So so you know how to navigate navigate all of that, we must we must go over. But you'll see um, how how to do it. The very first thing that happens is you need to protect some kind of wealth because uh, you need to get through this financial great reset. And I keep on hinting, it's bullion. Gold bullion, silver bullion. Um, but with understanding that they, they will confiscate it as soon as they realize 
people are, are hoarding it. So, so you've got to be nimble, nimble as fuck. But the, the very first thing is to be, to be is, is to try and diversify your assets out of things that you don't have to talk to an intermediary to get to them. So if, if you have to, you know, however inter, many intermediaries are between you and your cash is, uh, is a measure of how, how improbable it is that you get to that, that cash in a crisis and a crisis is coming. Yeah, I was thinking about the intermediary thing and, uh, you know, people who probably are buying gold or silver, um, but are they actually, when the time comes, are they actually going to be able to do anything with it before it becomes too late to do anything with it? You know, um, I, it's my belief that the... Gold and silver is deep in our collective memory as as valuable. I, if you if you get a hold of a gold coin like a, a maple or don't don't get an eagle, they're too many. The eagles are they're too many counterfeits. But if you get a Krugerrand or a maple, something with 0.999 percent, um, then if you just hold it in your hands and flip it around, you you'll see that it, you can feel it's valuable. You, you don't, you see, we've lost touch because we got everything flim flam and virtual reality now. And, but, you know, we have digital currency. So it's like people have lost touch with, with currency. But uh, when they have to really earn it, when they're really hungry and they need real money to, uh, to get some bread, then, uh, then they will rediscover um, the idea of money as valuable and not just digits or points in a game. Uh, and when they do that, when you hold, when you really start to value money again, uh, there's no question that the the visceral feel of of holding gold and silver in your hand, it, you you can feel it as worthy and money, and you know why that the people you know used to venerate. It. Um, this goes back so to what you were. I just it's reminding me of what you said about the the admirable Crichton uh, and and sort of uselessness. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know where it was in um, uh, some little thing. Somebody had bought for the first time and they, they were shocked because uh, of, of the weight, you know, just what you're saying, the tactility and, 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 and uh, they, they had obviously never experienced anything like this before. Um, and uh, it, it was very much the same thing about being out of touch with, doing things for yourself and having a, a feel for not just for doing things for yourself but also uh i think the error that we make in society you know like people driving around in their cars and they don't understand what's going on inside that engine and the the immense forces and the huge amount of energy that's exchanging there is just beyond there they, they have no um they, they've got no feel for it no, no, no sense of it. It's just an abstraction, um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, I, you know, I just thinking about that because you know, really, the, the that attitude, what you were just saying about holding a, a you know, a, a silver coin or a gold coin, um, you know, for people who have not done that, who don't realise, who, who, you know, you look at a periodic table and you, and if you've never picked up a gold coin before, but you from a periodic table, you you ought to be able to, to expect what your experience is going to be like, but it, people can't even, they don't even have that kind of knowledge generally. Um, it's just... Uh, well, yeah. yeah, you see, this is why I recommend uh, boats. <laughs> I can't recommend boats enough because we need to get back to what's real. And uh, a boat puts you in touch with what's real quickly. So we... We're completely immersed in the unreal, in the virtual, in the digital, and it's it's absolute crap. Everybody's job is just you know tapping away at a keyboard. You know, it's not even a paper shuffle. It's, it's not even as real as paper. It's it's you know even you know we're even paperless now. It's like not not even paper <laughs> uh, covers it. So 
so it's utterly ephemeral it's just you know uh flip-flops and a you know bits in a in a machine it's like you can't get any more virtual than that it's it's literally the most basic representation of information so it's in other words as abstract as you can possibly get and everything's abstract now everything's been abstracted into insignificance but you see uh, and everything allows you to you you turn on a tap and the water comes up it's actually real water but it's ab utterly abstract to people if on a boat you have to actually plan that make that water so you know when when i switch on the tap and some water comes up that only happens because i i planned it to get the solar and the solar got me enough uh, enough power to run my water maker i had to be in a place where the water was fresh enough to make the water and so then basically you know when the water comes out i've earned that fucking water <laughs> it took a lot of planning to get to and basically that's where you know it's it's real when the water comes out it's like real and it's the same with the, the gas all the resources i use they real because i have to think about them i have to plan them now it's very obvious when people you know have visitors on the boat is they they utterly oblivious to what's real they, they'll fill up a kettle you know a huge kettle like this they'll use half a fucking thing of gas to, to, to heat it up and they'll make half a cup of tea and i say like seriously you know how much energy it takes to warm up like five mm. liters of water it's like and then they have like a little cup like this and it's like they they kind of like crazy people they 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 you know they and then they'll put the They'll put the hot water in a in a little glass with a lemon and say like you know that lemon in hot water actually eats plastic they don't know they're not in touch with the physical world so they fuck up everything they use masses of resources nothing works and they're miserable they they, they say this is hell on a boat because you have to think all the time what you're doing you have to be aware of real shit and you say yeah this is the world that, that, that is coming so, so you know don't think in terms of more abstract things people think well if i'm going to survive the flipping i have to get all these skills and stuff yeah you do but again you're still thinking like a like a caged chimp you're still thinking too abstract start start basically so get familiar with real shit. get familiar with real shit. So, you know, taking courses and stuff is just more virtual, unreal shit, right? So saying like, first, when you understand what's real, then you'll understand what you need. Because, you know, it's a, there, there's an industry of people that are taking these young kids that know that collapse is coming and they teaching them survival skills that are not. So that you can go to Nicaragua or, you know, Ecuador, or any fucking, all these places in the jungle you can spend big monies like you know a few grand you'll fly out there and they'll tell you how to do an eco village and how to do survival and to get in touch with your fucking aura or some shit and then basically you have ayahuasca and you know it's like all of this is unreal shit so it's basically if you go into the eco village you'll find out they have solar panels and wind farms and all the shit that you absolutely will not need because there's no use that a hunter gatherer has for a computer for a wind turbine for a water turbine for anything it's absolutely useless fucking shit and they it's basically but that people don't know because they're completely out of touch with what's real you you're better off rather than spending two grand just just go live with go live with some homeless people uh, it's a free education and it'll be far far better than going off into the jungles in ecuador to be ripped off by some some guys that are taking money from privileged rich kids that are pre prepping so yeah so you know black people uh people that are at the bottom of the social hierarchy and stuff like that they know they have an expression keep it real dude <laughs> it's like go find out what real is and then it's the rest is comes easy man it's kind of like um cargo cult too you know i mean uh uh you know people will say oh well i get the, i get the cargo cult but but they on the other hand they're, they're they're living it as well um you know they say oh it's all right i know all this stuff comes from a factory but but uh you know 
you still just go and pull it off a shelf and uh, or it's delivered you don't even have to lift your finger you don't, you don't need to think about how it, how it came into existence what it needed to be done it just arrives for you well this is very dangerous because uh, people have a sense of certainty that is unwarranted so the pandemic's done a great job of you know, pulling people out of their complacency. They realize actually, you know, the shops do actually go bare occasionally. The shelves do actually empty. Um, but you see, they're, they're not virtually in tune. It's just like, oh, somebody, you know, the, the zookeeper stopped feeding us. Oh, shock, horror. Uh, and so, but you see, they're not gauging uh, which bits are resilient and which bits are not. So the, the simple rule of thumb is how many, how long is the chain? So it's how long is the, the chain to get to you? So, so if you if you're eating processed food, um, you know you you eventually get to the stage where if you get familiar with the real, where you can pick up a piece of food or something, and you can say, okay, this has at least a hundred people involved in bringing it into my hand. And then you know you can go into a garden, look at a fruit tree, and you can pick something and say, okay, there's zero people between me and this <laughs> this fruit. And you start to see things in in you know a different way, uh, and basically the way is is real because it's how permanent they are. So uh, you know picking a fruit or vegetable out of out of your garden or out of somebody else's garden is <clears throat> is probably far more resilient than having you know shit sent to you from from China by you know fifty different stages and fifty different intermediaries before it gets into your hand. So you know you can you can look at this apple, which is is you know, polished and nicely grown and stuff, and has a little label that says you know, has a chiquito banana or something. You say like, okay, how many fucks actually touched this thing to get into my hand? You know, well, probably eighty percent of them had COVID, <laughs> but anyway. The, so you know that's that's this thing. And then this thing, which looks a little gnarly, and the birds have eaten it, and but it comes from the market, from this uh, from this guy who sells it out of the back of his truck here in Greece, and grows it in his backyard. So it's like this has one person between you and your nutrition, and this has about a hundred, and you know how many of them have COVID? A lot. That's the way you start looking at the world, and that's better than any education um, you'll get in. If I can village in Ecuador. Uh, maybe change the subject. Uh, uh, the recent uh, little group of people you found, the, the Kosa Brin Society in Slovenia, uh, what was behind that? Did you know something about them or, or did they just pop up out of the blue? It, sa it sounded as though you must have had some background information or I got that impression. I uh, know it's a guy who's been kind of lurking uh, right uh, since I started um, making videos. And so I've, uh, yeah, we've, we've exchanged lots of emails and ideas and stuff. And it's a very, I've never been to Slovenia, but it's a very, um, from him, I gather, it's a very strange, <laughs> a very strange place. And, amazingly amazingly restrictive um so so what you can do there and what you're capable of doing in terms of activism and stuff like that is is uh, very very uh restricted um and so yeah we've been exchanging thoughts and stuff and he's been working on a on a project uh with with other people and they they're just getting launched um but yeah i could yeah, just uh, uh, just had the impression that there was a background there that you hadn't said anything about, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a very unique environment and challenging in in that country. So I I think it's a, it, what I'm trying to say is I don't think the stuff they they come up with will travel. I don't think you can replicate it. Very easily, but I don't know. Maybe there are other countries that are are similar, but it's it's sort of um, a very idiosyncratic place by the sounds of things. So it's like 
um it's it's unique it's it's i mean it's it's utterly intriguing to me because uh the you know it is um it, it is a big uh, salad bowl <laughs> and then yeah I get, it, he, he tells me all sorts of interesting things that I find really fascinating. And one of them is um, that all these people have uh, all the stuff available to them. They, they can actually easily grow their stuff. A lot of people have property and can actually, you know, start growing shit. Um, they, they, don't, they can collect wood and stuff. They, they're very well, well situated for prepping, but they, they didn't, they you know the even the old folks they kind of uh, went for gas you know natural gas and stuff for cooking um because they, they even though it was more expensive they didn't they didn't like uh, doing all the hard craft of collecting firewood and stuff like that so they they gradually drifted towards the <clears throat> the modern world um you know just out of kind of well you, you almost say laziness, but it's kind of short-sightedness. They actually had to work harder for the for the money to buy the gas than they they did going and collecting it. So it's kind of, I think we've it, it gives you all sorts of insights into what we've done in in our own society is um, or the the kind of American Anglophile I society. I think um, it. When it, I was it, so okay. Uh, okay. You can go ahead. Oh, DB. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that it dupes you with uh, convenience, but it's shortchanging you in the long yeah, term. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's kind of like look at the you got to read the book like the original affluent society, which is about hunter gatherers, and the, you, we, I was told this myth when I was at school that you know oh it was all nasty British and short and all this fucking Hobbesian myth about uh, hunter gatherers and then and then when when we actually went and saw you know some people and all of these people they say like these people just fuck around all day but they they would uh, they would tell us you know it's basically it's again it's the this authoritarian double speak so they they would tell us at school that you know like this place would be nothing before white people got here they didn't even have the wheel um, there was you know this place was a wreck and uh, white people built this country uh, without white people organizing everything and providing science and the, the way it's like, you know, Africans are just lazy fucks that would lie around all day. And that's what they do. Look at them. They just lie around all fucking day when they could have been inventing the wheel. They would have got nowhere if it wasn't for us. And then, you know, by the, the, same, the same token, then they say, oh, uh, you know, but hunter-gatherer lifestyle is nasty, brutish, and short, and you have to work your ass off all the time, and you ravage by disease, and it's fucking awful. And you say, but but you were just these guys are hunter-gatherers that you're just telling us sit around having fun all day instead of doing the graft to build a country. And you say, well, which is it? Well, obviously, it's a fucking lie. It's, you see, what everybody's done is they've they they uh, they they have the false promise of of luxury. So 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 now. All these people, you know, they also told me at school was like, oh, you know, the biggest problem, this was from Keynes, was the biggest problem that people are going to have when you grow up is what to do with all their free time. Because there's going to, you're only going to be working a couple of days a week because of all the automation and stuff. And so, you know, there'll be masses of leisure and it's going to be a big problem because not everybody can deal with lots of leisure. And you know, this is what they told us. And of course, when when you grow up, you find out. Well, fucking hell! Now, now I work twice as hard as my dad ever worked. And so they, you know, they're like, "What? You know, what? What the fuck happened?" Well, everybody thinks that you know, oh, we're gonna live this life of luxury, and they put so much work into it. They put ten times much work into this luxury that uh, you know they'd be better off without it. They wouldn't be working so hard if they didn't have it. Um, yeah, the example. Uh because I was involved with some bicycle people um, se several times over, the calculation has been done regarding the use of a car to travel. And, you know, and basically in every instance, if you calculate the amount of time that the person has to work for to pay for the car in all of its cost, 
and add that time to the to the time of their car trip, it's faster to ride a bicycle wherever you want to go. Yep, um, it, <laughs> that's yeah, me. You, you, that's yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm um, doing that. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it's a beautiful but, thing but, to keep but, in mind. This, this is an important point because this this taps on socialism, right? So, so you see, one of the things people don't think of is they don't they don't follow the whole loop, right? So, you know, this. This is one of the costs of socialism. So uh, people think, you know, healthcare system and everything is wonderful. Um, you know, how, what kind of a Luddite are you that you don't like the healthcare system? And, you know, you, you know, you hypocrite. Um, if you got sick, you'd be the first one to go to hospital and uh, plead for them to treat you and stuff like that. And say, say, yes, yes, yes. But how long, how many days of the of the year do you actually work to pay for the tax that will go into socialized medicine? And I'm telling you, you're working a couple of months. So by the time you worked a couple of months out of the year to pay for the medicine, it's like, why do you need all that medicine? Because of the stress of that extra couple of months. So nobody actually asks. They just take it for as read as, I'm scared of disease. And so anybody that can help me with my disease phobia and my, my fear of medicine and promise me health care, I'll vote for them and like I'll do any crazy shit just to make sure they're hospitals. And you say, well, hang on a minute. No, can't, aren't you prepared to do even basic uh, arithmetic? No. It's like hospitals, good. Everything else, bad. Monkey, bad. Wild, bad. Hospitals, good. And you say, like, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's nothing that, that is black and white. So saying like, the reason, why do you need these hospitals? Well, because of all these diseases. Look at the statistics. Heart attack, diabetes, all of COVID, all of these things. Like, why do you have them? Because of the industrial system. Why do you have the industrial system? Because that's what it is means to actually have hospitals. We're doing the industrial system so we can have hospitals, and the hospitals are there because the industrial system is taking its toll on us. So nobody completes the circle. Yeah. So like, yeah. You know, if we got rid of industrialism, we wouldn't need the fucking hospitals. But it's like no one can get there and make that leap. So, so yeah. they're killing themselves to basically fight for these luxuries. They're, 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 you know, chasing a mirage. Yeah, and it's also healthier. Like I got asked one time, like um, I was at a phone store like six or five years ago, however long I've been riding my bike. And he asked me, he's like, why are you riding your bike? Because he thought I was like virtue signaling and being an environmentalist. And I was like, no, I fucking hate cars. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it also comes with its own rewards because you get healthier. Like, you know, my calf muscles are as hard as rocks because I walk and ride a bike everywhere. It literally gets you in shape. It's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so hunter gatherers uh, didn't have dentists. Why? Because they didn't need them. You see, you're, here's the thing that you, you need to be, you know, socialists need to be drilled on. Say, so like, if you want to be a socialist, why? Mainly because of socialized mention. I kind of said this in the very first um, uh, video that I made in episode one. And they're basically, if economists do the survey where they say, like, you ask people today, would you prefer to be alive today and and um, have a income of about 70,000 K or, you know, basically middle class, or would you uh, prefer to live in 1900 and be a millionaire? Because, uh, you know, 70,000, if it was translated in real terms, just to, to 1900, it would be a millionaire salary. Well, over 90% of people in, in, in the developed world, say that they would rather live today with 70,000 K than live in 1900 with a million. And you say, like, I'm appalled. Because, you see, I, I lived in the kind of back century when, you know, South Africa was behind the times and there was much. So I know very, very, very viscerally what an Edwardian existence is like. I'm saying, like, a millionaire in the Edwardian thing, you, you are living like, you know, Queen Elizabeth today. You seriously, you would make that trade? And you, if you look into it, I say, why? Why middle class, middle class sucks. What the fuck can you do as a middle class person today? Fuck all. So, so I'm appalled at that. But, but if you look into it, the reason is medical care, 
See, what everybody's scared of is that in 1900, you could basically get a prick on your finger and uh, you would get tetanus and die. Now you just have antibiotics. And so they, they all scared of the that they wouldn't have medical care. But here's, here's the problem is that you're, you're not only, if you go further back than that, back to the hunter gatherers, you don't need the medical care. Hunter gatherers never got cancer. They never had any dental problems. So you need to tell that to socialists. It's like, you know, it, it's like all the system of socialized care that you want is you don't need it unless you have an industrial system. And it's like the industrial system isn't worth it. it. It basically, it's like, why not get rid of the industrial system and get rid of socialized medicine? And then you'd be healthy and you would have all your leisure time. But no one can get there. They, they, they're stuck on this idea that all these goodies are worth it. But you can easily prove to somebody that their goodies are not worth it. If I maintain that if you just got anybody and said, you know, you run out tomorrow and buy the next model of iPhone. It's like everybody run, runs out to do it. They all get their little pennies, scrape them together, and they get their digital cash, or they put it on credit, and they run and get the new iPhone. It's like how many people would run and get the iPhone if they actually had to mine all the raw materials in it so if if before you had an iphone you had to actually go down you know a mine somewhere in the congo you had to replace the little kid that goes down that cobalt mine to get your cobalt if you had to do that for three weeks to give yourself you know and do, did the same in a copper mine and say you had to do that first before you could own any one of these these gadgets um, and then you had to do three months in a cobalt mine or three weeks in a cobalt mine to pay for a life science supply of cobalt that you could use in a phone. How many people would get a, an iPhone? Fuck all. <laughs> the only reason they're doing it is because some little bastard is going down the mine, that cobalt mine, to get that shit for them. And the, the, the reason why they it looks like they can afford it as a first world person, like, you know, they, they're utterly unproductive. All the people buying iPhones are tapping away at a keyboard doing absolutely fuck all. It's like it's zero productivity. It's just rearranging bits. But they tell themselves, well, I've got enough money to put this kid down a cobalt mine. And you say, only because of the gun, only because of the, the financial system, only because of the industrial system, then you, you are a house slave that basically is riding this poor little kid down this cobalt mine. But you, if you actually had to pay, so in other words, what I'm saying is you're freeloading on his productivity. If you had to go down that actual mine and produce that shit that goes into all your crap, you wouldn't do it. You absolutely wouldn't do it. If you had to do time to actually serve the real goods that go into that shit, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't have a car. You wouldn't have a fucking trip on a, on a plane. You wouldn't have a cell phone. You just wouldn't do it. Why? Because go down a fucking mine. Go down a fucking mine and see what it's like. You wouldn't do it. So you're a hypocrite. You're an utter fucking shit. Here, can we just, I want to go back for a minute to uh, Slovenia. Um, when I was looking at, at that fellow's, looks like he's got an old farmhouse that he's restoring or something. And uh, uh, there was another video popped up on YouTube about a uh, a priest in in Italy who'd taken three years off and gone to live in the mountains somewhere, and he uh, restored a uh, an old uh, farm cottage, stone cottage, uh, and he was sort of up there living as a her hermit's lifestyle in in the mountains. Uh, and he was saying that actually a, a lot of those I, I think this was in northern Italy in like mountainous area. Um, and he was saying that they, uh, those areas are actually very depopulated and that there is a, are a lot of uh, abandoned old farmhouses and that there. Um, and uh, you sort of had the impression that, that it was a little bit of a scenario like what you were saying about the, the people buying gas instead of collecting wood. Is it, a, you know, maybe... Uh, People had they'd left their rural lifestyle and moved to the to the cities and just abandoned their their places in the countryside. Uh, he, you know, he was saying he bought this cottage for twenty thousand euros or something, um, and uh, he's it's you know uh, it was interesting because he was sort of showing 
panning out across this beautiful valley, wooded valley, and you could just see, you know, here and there, there was some little cottages buried away. And, you know, uh, apparently um, there's nobody there. He, he said his nearest neighbour is some, some guy in his 70s, you know, a couple of kilometres away. Um, okay, so this is yeah, a I, very important point, and I'm very, very glad you, you raised it. So, uh, okay, as uh, particularly Anglo Anglophiles and people that say live in LA or London or something, we have a very definite idea of, you know, the WOG started the Danube, is <laughs> how so they used to, used to say it. Um, we are very uh, centered on the old Roman world. Um, and the the Roman Empire. So you know, basically, the everything um, past the Danube is kind of like uh, primitive and scary and no man's landy and stuff. And so, um, and we have when we talk about collapse, we talk very much about you know our Hollywood very insular um, idea. Um, and the you know the wilderness is very definitely from a National Geographic uh, documentary. You know, there's wilderness in Africa. There isn't. Um, they, um, you know, we have this funny view of the world that's kind of completely made up and false. So now this is desperately important because if you're going to survive, uh, you know, people say, well, well, you know, should I hook up with people in the, in the Amazon or something like this? We have a very distorted view of, of the world and uh, demographics and which bits are safe and which bits are good for survival. So what you'll find is if you go to places very close to home, I'm talking about so close to home, I'm talking about Italy, Greece, all the Eastern Bloc countries, all of these things, right? They, they are depopulated because of um, the EU and industrialism and stuff like that. They, because they're not on the map, because shit doesn't happen there and you don't get all these dramatic things from CNN headlines, then they're completely out of our consciousness. Now, to survive in this world, I think you've got to th learn to appreciate gray and appreciate blind spots. You see what? You see everybody else has this um, the, this kind of herd mentality where everybody, you know, you you go, oh, Bitcoin, and everybody, oh, they rush for the Bitcoin and they, yeah, survival this, and everybody. You see, you must start to think in a different way. Is find find the shit that the gaps that people are not seeing so in a, it's an elaborate way of saying you've got to be con contrarian and you've got to look for the boring the least action and all the stuff everybody's looking for the action everybody's looking for for the opportunity everybody's l looking for where the risk and danger is so don't look for the bland the ordinary look for the bits that people have missed and once you get into that mindset they're fucking vast and close at hand so, so Greece is a very personal example. Is there's tons of shit. There's their houses. King, there, there's land. I mean, you know, you talk about guerrilla gardening on a fucking, you know, piece of Los Angeles or something. It's like you can farm and fucking island here. There's there's nobody there. There's an abandoned. There's a, a one house. On, on some of these places that I could show you. There's there's one house, it's basically an absentee landlord, and it's it's some dispute in the family. And the family lives in Athens or in America or something, and they're never gonna fucking get rid of this property because every time they it comes up in family conversation, they immediately have a war. And so this is over and over. Their boundary disputes is this it's it's the fucking wild west, and nobody knows. Because basically when, when they come out here, they come out to all the tourist spots and they don't actually go and get into the nitty gritty, right? All the bland bits, all the stuff. And then once you start doing that, you start realizing everybody's in upside down world. The, the boring bits, the bland bits, the gray bits are the most fascinating and interesting and deep and varied and stuff. And so there's just like you're saying, is that there's this abandoned land, there are these utopias of, of untouched things. No, no scientist is ever going to write a paper on it because, you know, if you're a scientist, you go big and you do the, you know, go and study the Amazon and you go and uh, talk about Mungo Bay. And so we get stuck in this narrative, which is utter bullshit. And so, so there's this golden opportunities all over the place, but they, they're hidden in plain sight. But to get to them, you just have to do contrarian thinking. So what's contrarian?
Aryan thinking. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you. It's like I I I lost all the gold that I got, but I I I could have been fucking super rich on gold because I had money during the dot com era, and so. Um, Basically, in like 2001, I asked this guy who I, I thought, well, well, everybody, you know, the economy is going mad. Investments are going mad. And I thought, well, I don't want to invest in the latest thing because it's almost definitely if it's if it's popular, it's it's going to crash and it's useless. So so what do I invest in? So I, I thought, well, I uh, my boss was a Canadian guy and he was very, very con conventional, but well read middle class guy. And so. You know, I, I went to him and I said, like, uh, you know, he was all big into investments and investing and the best things and sliced bread. And, and I presume now he must be up to his elbows in Bitcoin if he's not ruined. But anyway, I said to him, like, OK, yeah, yeah, you've got all the great investments and all the good things to get. And what's the shittest investment you could possibly think of? Said, Go away and tell me what the shittest thing to invest in. <laughs> and he came back and he said, I've got it. He said, gold. So, so gold is a useless fucking investment. It's just pointless. So I immediately went out, stocked up on a few hundred Ks worth of gold, gold bullion. <clears throat> it was $275 at that stage. <clears throat> it wasn't long before it went, went uh, 1,800 close to 2,000. So you must, you must find out what's boring. So if, if, if you ever hear... People say, oh, this is boring. That's boring. And they're like, that's where you want to head. Go away from the interesting shit and head to the boring shit. That's the best survival tip I could possibly give you. Even now, the boring shit. No. Mario is still saying that about gold even now, though, on his channel. You know, that, that people are, are still tending to buy paper, silver, and paper gold and completely overlooking uh, what they're missing. Um, you know, they're just still part of the system with, the, with their paper. Um, but, uh, yeah. All the exciting shit is in the dull. You know? mm. All the opportunities are, are in the doldrums, right? Yeah. yeah no, I was thinking if everybody's that. running off run, running after the rabbit. It's like, forget the rabbit. Let everybody else chase the rabbit. Let everybody else run away. From the line, um, it's a thing that I've often stuff. thought about. With the interesting, I've often thought about this uh, regarding the, the the United States because, um, you know, just from watching various videos and things that come up on YouTube now and then, you get the impression that there's a huge amount of, uh, um, you know, a, a large numbers of abandoned buildings and and uh, 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 you know in urban areas and and around the place. Um, which claim, you know, appears nobody's ever going to come back to them. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of scope there, which people don't seem to be um, taking into account. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I've said this a number of times. I've said this a number of times, but associated with all of those things, what what you'll find if you start getting into this mindset is you, you will find that the underground society. So. You know, while we go on and on about all the stuff that appears in the news, that it's just the tip of the iceberg. The 90% of shit that really goes on, particularly in a place like America, is going on underground. So you will never see it. This is inaccessible to reporters and stuff, again, because it's, it's, not, it's not sensational enough. So, so it never appears in the mainstream consciousness, but it is the bulk of the of the iceberg, the ninety percent. And what I mean is, there's there's a sewer people. There, there are whole cultures, there are hobo cultures and subcultures and stuff. They are living and thriving under the fucking pavement, almost literally. So if if you if you go and go and try and get into abandoned building and stuff, you will not find oh you're the first person oh you know I'm white middle class and I just made this break breakthrough that these things are empty no they're not they're filled with this underground culture of people that you know all sorts man you just you 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 know if you say like get in they say like find the others and what what they mean is like Go on the internet and find like-minded people. And you say, like, no, the others are under your feet. The Morlocks are almost literally living in the sewers. There, there's whole cultures of, of uh, countercultures living right below <laughs> the flagstones that are 
utterly outside this 10% little sliver, which we think is the whole world. But, but I mean, it, it's everywhere. It's like I tell people that like the majority of the internet is the dark web. People don't realize that. They think it's all Zuck and all this blah, blah shit and say, no, that's a, a tiny little fringe. The, the vast majority of shit that's going on is the dark web and it's basically the dark culture. And within our cityscapes and our uh, seascapes, you know, they're, they're all these, you know, like, guys, yeah, people are not as dumb as you think. Just because you're a fat, well-fed, caged liberal, it doesn't mean everybody's that fucking stupid. Not everybody is as stupid as people in, in say, XR. Like, loads and loads of people know what's fucking coming. So they've been prepping. So, so finding the other means dropping out of, of this bullshit. So, I mean, I'm coming into the the lunatic asylum and your death camp. But, like, I'm, I'm not of your death camp. I'm, I'm just infiltrating it so that I can basically find people and haul them out. But you can haul yourself out by getting in contact with the others. All it is is just drop out of your milieu. Just drop out of your people with, you know, fucking shit for brains. Just, just basically go and talk to a homeless person. Go, go and talk to some renegade. So if, if you're middle class, you cannot see these people. That I'm telling you, there are literally ghosts walking around places in America. There, there, there are cultures of, of paranormal beings walking around on the streets. If, you, if you're middle class, you cannot see them. Because you, you're always rejecting them. You, you're like, oh, there's a homeless person. Oh, there's a there's a weird person. Oh, there's a cop. Oh, there's a rich person. It's, it's, you, you're busy editing out your entire worldview as you walk down the street. And you wouldn't dream of stopping and talking to a crazy person. Stop and do it. You, you will find as world opens up that fucking you suddenly realize, hang on a minute. You mean all this, you know... All the thing that you think is the whole world is just this tiny sliver and say, yeah, the big dark culture underneath is basically that's where it's at. Get in contact with that. Go, go and do something unusual and you'll, you'll start to see all of these things going on. The police and stuff, they, they know all of this. The, the police have contact with all of that, <laughs> that other world. A, a policeman knows that there are all these subcultures and stuff, but while we're doing all the culture wars and the gender wars and all of this shit, it's like, it's utterly ephemeral. It's it's like shit going on in the first class dining when it's like, we, we, we don't even know of the millions down in steerage. And there's like, these guys are not stupid. They're close to the water and they know the water's coming up on the Titanic. So if you're talking about survival, it's going, you know, it's like, stop, jabbering about you know to people on first class dining because they're like they'll be like oh i think he's full of it i don't think that uh, you know the titanic is going to sink i have this friend who's actually in academia and very well known you know and you're like don't talk to those ass heads go and talk to somebody in steerage and they'll say dude you wouldn't believe what it's like down there the water's coming in fucking fast and this ship's gonna sink which one do you want to talk to? Well, everybody talks to the bloody fucking Toph. So they're like, Toph's done our shit. They haven't been down in the engine room. Good. And I, I mean this all over. I mean this in the scientific community. It's all like, oh, who's a big name? Well, well, and write them off immediately. Go and talk to all the little fucking grub nuts who, who uh, government, uh, government scientists that are at the bottom of the, the fucking scientific community uh, in the Arctic or something in some station. And they say like, you will not fucking believe the shit. So you go and talk to the guys at the bottom. They, they will tell you all the shit that you need to survive. But your, your whole world's going to disintegrate. It's going to break up like fucking Arctic ice when, as, soon, as soon as you start talking to, uh, to real people. <laughs> Get in touch with the real people. Yeah. Um, no, I I had a few experiences like that um, out on my bicycle exploring places because you can, on the one hand, you can cover a bit of ground, but on the other hand, wherever you're going, you're moving slowly enough that you can see things that other people miss. And, you know, you're not taking the main street. You're going up some little back alley, you know, 
place where where people don't normally travel and it's it's uh, you know the number of times I got a little glimpse into these other worlds uh, you know and you you really start to feel it the real the existence of, of, of this um, different culture going on just just around the corner you know or behind a wall somewhere or you know um, uh, it's 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 very interesting actually it, it's just opens up another a whole different perspective on existence um, so, uh, yeah know. it's kind of yeah so not, I guess we should, we should... Um, Go I was on. just gonna say yeah because yeah. uh, you know being on a bike or walking you're more in touch with your senses that's the main reason why I hate cars I can't smell anything I can't feel anything on my skin yeah yeah, and you can't go. You, yeah, and, and you're also, going too quickly. Yeah. You can't see things. You know, um, you know. I, I mean, I always rather liked it because I like to keep to myself, and I found um, it enabled me to pay close attention to things. But at the same time, uh, if I didn't want to get caught up in some situation, I could just move away from it fairly quickly without any bother, you know, which is hard to do if you're walking and you've gone up the wrong street or something like that, you know, um, you can get cornered. Um, but, yeah, it, it, there's also that sense of just um, – it, it, it's also a sense of what Hugh was saying earlier about, you know, guests on his boat boiling up a, a litre of water to make a cup of coffee. And, um, you know, when you when you're – uh, moving on a bicycle like that, you you uh, you're responsible for your own transportation energy, uh, and you know what that means, and you know how to use it wisely. Um, and there's also this wonderful feeling of uh, yeah, you know, I think it's very much the equivalent of, of the kind of euphoria that Hugh gets from sailing. Uh, it is uh, you know I think you can get that on a bicycle too. For, very much the sort of yeah. feeling of independence yeah, and freedom, you, can, you know. You can feel like you're flying sometimes too, which is nice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, but, I think there's a lot yeah, of... Well, it's, yeah, but particularly on a boat. So on a boat, the, the sailing community is very multi-layered and there are many subcultures and shit that, you know, the shit that goes on in the sailing community, you would not fucking believe. But... Uh, Anyway, I, I definitely have my hopes um, and survival strategy pinned on uh, the, the waterfront and the sailing community. <laughs> I, I can't tell anybody enough of uh, once you, yeah. you get immersed in it, you find it's another world. Um, but, yeah, I guess it's we should wrap it up because we've going, been going okay. for a couple of hours. But I, I just want to tell you, I, I just want to tell you one story about about this mentality of of getting out of the world of appearances. So the middle class and the upper class live in a world of appearances. And the only reason this whole tissue of lies and this industrial system that's completely unworkable and unsustainable and has no future, the only reason it appears to work is because it it, it works from appearances. Everything is appearances. The the government is, you know, appears to be stronger than it looks. The police are on, you know, hanging on by a thread, but they appear to be a big force. Everything is kind of opposite, and it's all based on appearances. And so let me give you a, a graphic example of the story, which I'm not sure I told, but anyway, I'll tell it now. So just, just one story of, of how I got through uh, the border in South Africa. I, ma I managed to get through, I managed, managed to get into South Africa uh, without, without going through passport control, uh, almost by accident. And so, but I'll tell you how, how I did it. Um, uh, so, yeah, so basically I arrived on a plane and, um, and uh, you know, every, you know, it's like one flight from civilization, say, once a week at this place. Uh, and so, you know, everybody you have like... Uh, I don't know, 700 people, they're all, you know, queuing up to pass port control. It's a big mess and everything. So I, I ambled off, you know, two gentlemen from Verona style, uh, trying to be the last. I hate crowds and lining up and do anything to avoid it. 
so you know I, I went and saw all this thing and see that they have like 10 customs agents and passport agents and stuff and i thought oh well this is going to fucking take hours and they were you know they're being a bit brutal and officious and you know pretty nazi and so i thought well fuck this um I, i'm just gonna like i'm not gonna get involved in this i'm just gonna wander around the bits of the airport that i can um and you know just um just so i don't have to get involved in all this mayhem and so then I, I started wandering around and I found, you know, I found you could get to all these places in the airport. Obviously, you know, they have barriers and stuff, so you can't pass. Um, they've, they've worked all of that out. So, but, you know, I just, I just hung around, had a look, went and sat in the sun in some places. And I went and I went and found, and there was one of these people, from, you know, the other world. There's just some, some guy with a mop somewhere. And so, you know, I'd been to Africa for about a decade. So I went and spoke to him. And he was kind of amazed because here's, here's this you know, white guy coming in and talking to him. Like, and, and so I had a wonderful time with him. And he, you know, gives me tea and gives me a joint. And we have a, you know, I, I got, before I'd even got into the country, I'd already had a deep insight into the country and where it's going all through the sky. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I spent ages having, you know, a super time, uh, you know, and eventually I thought, well, fuck it. I better go. Um, I better go back. And uh, probably all these guys, you know, a few hours have gone by. I better go back and uh, go through passport control now. Uh, it's probably cleared out. And when I came into the passport control hall, it was empty. All the 700 people are cleared out. So the the uh, the, the 10 uh, customs guys, passport control, they were all gone. They'd all gone home. So I just walked through and, oh, well, fuck it, and just went through into the country. Now, you see, all those 700 people, they played the game of appearances, that this is a passport control barrier. You're now coming into the country. Uh, therefore, you have to go through all of this shit and get, you know, searched and abused, and, uh, and they all went for it. They all stood in line to get abused. And I was the only one that said, fuck this. And just, just you know, said, I'm not doing it. Um, and then I didn't have to. You see, it was all a big shimmer, all a big front. It's all just appearances that now there's a big border here and you have to go through it and we have to abuse you. And it's, it's all this big ritual. But everyone, 700 people, 699 people thought that this was how the world was. Is that like, you know, you could just go have a good time with, with one of the, you know, sewer people and uh, you just walk through like you're royalty on a, on a purple carpet. So that's my little story is don't you forget it, that all of this stuff is horseshit. It's all horseshit, yeah. left and right. That and reminds me so, of that little um, George Carlin quote where he says, I'll save symbols for the symbol minded when they're talking about like the flag and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, but they all appearances. And the only thing works, the only reason why passport, you see, if all 700 people did what I did, passport control would be impossible and you'd have the anarchist dream of just, of just having no borders. But the reason why borders work is because people appear in border posts, present their passports and stuff and play, play this game of appearances. If everybody went, I'm not going through this border post, just went and, you know, this, there's a fucking forest track two meters to the fucking, you know, to the left of the border post, just, just take that one and go around it. It's like, nobody does that because their appearances and the rules and they will, oh, there'll be big shit. If you do that, horseshit. Um, uh, what you, what you reminded me of. Hugh, I think that's a very important story. Uh, I, I've done some things like that. Not, not quite, uh, not quite as, um, uh, to that extent, but smaller things where I have noticed, oh, well, I began to notice that, if, you know, if there's some requirement that has to be satisfied and, you, and uh, you know, for one reason or another, I hadn't been happy with it, I would just do nothing and just string it out and string it out and string it out. And, and you know, you reminded me of it because a number of times in the end that after several months or a year or whatever, had gone past and you checked up on it and you suddenly found that it uh, didn't matter anymore. 
that you didn't have to do whatever it was. So that you had gone past this expiry date, that all you have to do is just hang out for long enough and, and uh, you know, uh, assuming they're not in some situation where they're going to try and come and find you, I guess. Um, but I think currently with uh, just what everybody's going through now, um, uh, I was just thinking about that this afternoon with the vaccinations is, um, uh, you know, by the time that everybody's being required to have one every second month or every Monday morning before going to work and all the rest of it, uh, they're going to start losing count. It's going to become too difficult. Uh, you know, I think at some stage the whole thing's going to to, to sort of become uh, unwieldy, unwieldy and impractical. I don't know. Maybe I'm being a bit optimistic there. Uh, but I no, think there no, might be some I, benefit. This is what I'm encouraging this line of thought. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, exactly if, if, you know, if you can hold out for long enough, you might actually just find that, that A, you're better off yeah. because... You, you haven't taken a risk with the with the uh, whatever is in this stuff, and B, you might find that it just gets into be a post injection society where it's, you know, oh, okay, it just doesn't fucking work. Yeah, you know? um, yeah, I, I'm speaking in code, and you can only say so much. But you 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 nailed what I'm I'm trying to tell people. So it, it's like you got to get you got to become Greek. So the, the Greeks have spent 400 years under the Turks. Brutal people, horrible people, disgusting, genocidal shits, Turks, all of them. Not, not a single one is good. Uh, if you've ever met a good Turk, he's just pretending so he can get close to your pocket or your wife. Anyway, um, I can't say enough horrible things about Turks. Uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, uh, get Greek. Uh, so the... The, the, this is how the Greeks work, right? So, you know, you get uh, the the uh, the government in Athens and Syntagma Square there, they, they will pass some, something saying like, okay, everybody gets a hundred euro fine uh, if they're over 60 and they won't get the jab. You know, so now, sure, you get a few riots by the, the kids and stuff in, in Athens, but the average Greek doesn't give a shit. <laughs> it just passes over them like water. So why? Well, if you're English and law-abiding and you follow the rules and you 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 know make sure that you, you you appear at passport control, then you go hysterical because you know it's like oh this is terrible. And so look, first of all, a hundred. If you if you didn't want to get the jab and you you rich, you just it's just a tax. You just pay the hundred. And <laughs> why the hell not? If you're rich, it's just nothing. If if you're poor, then what the government says is, oh, we're going to take it out of your pension and you're going to take, you know, deduct it automatically and stuff. And so, like, you see, well, the Greeks are very, very casual about it because they know it's almost uncollectible. It's, it's like, how could you, how could you collect them? Even if you, even if you got it out of the, the taxes and stuff, but I mean, out of the the pensions and stuff like that is they, there's always way around. Is like no Greek is dumb enough to to survive on a government pension, right? I mean, the very the very few people that I would would trust, uh, you know, the government to to support them, they they all have some hustle on the side. So even if you took a hundred out. They, they will make it back with a vengeance, um, you know. So just think about it. Just think if you got the the police or something to go around um, and try and, you know, wheedle 100 bucks out of people every month, right? They, that's all they would be able to do. They wouldn't have any time for anything else. And so everybody else could make out like a bandit on their, on their side hustle because, you know, and the police know that. So everybody knows this is bullshit. But every yeah, you know, but it appears in the papers and the rest of the world and say this is a, you know foretaste and this like you say well if that happened in Britain you'd be in trouble why because everybody basically goes for the bullshit everybody's law abiding so if everybody's law abiding you can be as draconian as you want as you like and every, all the sheep go for it you see if if the sheep will refuse to basically go along you can't be totalitarian. 
So if your government's totalitarian, who do you have to blame? It's you. <laughs> you permitted it. You went along with it. Okay? It's like, you know, it doesn't, if you George Mombiot and you mouth off on you on YouTube about how, you know, the government is uh, getting authoritarian and that, you're a government stooge. The government wants you to make that video. The government wants you to be scared. The government wants you to think that you, you cannot get out of it. If Mombia went and made a video saying like, guys, you don't have to do this shit. It's like, here, these are all the ways you can wheedle around it. Here, make an underground culture. Just fucking go. You know, the message the government is trying to say to you by saying you're not allowed in all these places and, and unless you're all these conditions, that's a subtle hint from the universe to tell you you never wanted to be in those places in the list. It's, it's like... It's like hookers and drug dealers. Is it's like Mister. It's it's uh, you know like Back to the Future. It's like Biff's. If you're in Biff's world, and Biff says, you know, if you don't do the shit that I want, I'm not going to let you in the casino. I'm not going to let you in my brothels. I'm going to start restricting your alcohol. It's like what's the fucking message there? You didn't want to do those things anyway. It's kind of a hint that you shouldn't have been doing those things anyway. So Mr. Biff has just told you exactly the way to go. It's the way he told you not to go. So, so just bear that in mind all the time, is all these things are appearances, they're all ways of intimidating you, they're all ways of making them seem in control. And it basically, if, if the population started to think like a Greek, you just think, Come, come, come to Greece, Mr. Turk. Come, you invade Greece. We make sure you're very, very sorry, like the Germans. <laughs> That's how you got to think. Come, come, come with your authoritarian. We see who fucking winds up with the prick. Straight up the ass, Mr. Totalitarian. So, got to think like a Greek, man. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I can remember um, when I was younger, um, you know, like in the post-war period, a lot of Italian and Greek migrants came to Australia. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, it was pretty well a conservative white enclave here, having got rid of most of the Aborigines a long time before. And, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't like them. Um, and it was, yeah, even when I was at school, it was... It's, it was uh, um, you know, the, the Italian kids would associate with the Italian kids and nobody else, even if they'd been born here. Um, you know, there generally wasn't a lot of mixing. Um, and uh, uh, But one thing that, that was a bone of contention was that they, they were extremely good at working the system and getting uh, all, all sorts of... Uh, benefits and and uh things that 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 the uh you know that the the uh established australians were thinking hey you know that they're, they're cheating the government he, he's got a pension he doesn't deserve somebody else got compensation money they didn't deserve that they're, they're, they're you know they're they're working our system and all the rest of it and you could see uh where they were coming from because they you know the country they had come from this was normal survival practice and everybody did it and they would come here and see absolutely no moral reason at all why they shouldn't just continue doing the same thing um, while all the law-abiding, you know, residents of, of Australia were uh, were saying, oh, no, 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 you you know, you don't, that's not, you shouldn't do that kind of thing, you know, uh, when they could have been doing it all along too, most likely, you know. Um, but yeah, you get you get that. that uh, yeah, it, it, these were is, generally is, is, these were well, people from from uh, 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 you know less well-off people who had obviously come here for so-called for a better life, you know. So they were coming from a position of, of, of in Greece and Italy where they would have been very accustomed to living between the spaces and you know um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So this is. This is a very important point. It's like, um, yeah, so the survival 101, 
is uh, you've got to learn to work the system. I Nobody's going to make it through the collapse of this global industrial system that obeys the rules, right? That That's a given. Is is If you obey the rules, you will wind up smelling gas. I'm telling you, that's your destiny. Is You've got to go against the system and you've got to learn to work the system. Now, I want all the socialists and goody two-shoes, uh, liberals and uh, middle-class house slaves say, it's like, well, if everybody thought like that, then the whole thing would fall apart. And I say, yes, genius, the whole thing would fall apart. And that's what needs to happen. We need to get to the thing where everything, the whole fucking scheme falls apart. Because you are making a little bit of a, you're freeloading nicely, but for pennies as a house slave. But your compliance as a house slave is, by, is making the, the plantation owners make out like bandits. And they, so you, are, you, you have false loyalty to the top. You house slaves, you liberals, all you fucking momboyots, your actual loyalties are to the bottom, right? You are actually a slave. And don't you fucking forget it. And so as a slave, you do not want the plantation. You've been bought cheap because basically they allow you in the house. You don't want to be a house slave. You want to be free. So basically, the, we want the system to come down. So yes, work the system, work the system to your benefit, and basically make sure that everybody does. And then it'll, you know, the plantation system will end. All the plantation owners will be on their ass, and then we'll all be better off. Plantation owners, house slaves, and the field slaves will all be better off when the plantation goes. But the, while you support the plantation, we're in shit and heading for gas. Right? This plantation is a labor camp. It turns into a death camp. That's its destiny. When times get tough and they can't feed it, if you don't believe me, have a look at Turkey. 3.6 million people are kept in concentration camps. Why? Because Erdogan is in the privatized prison business. He made a deal with psychopath Merkel, that she gives him 400 euros a head every month to keep those guys in camps and out of Germany. That's Angela Merkel's legacy, is a death camp. So it's fine while Europe can pay 400 euros to Erdogan to keep these people in a behind barbed wire. That's fine, all fine and dandy. What happens when Germany can't pay that 400 euros anymore? What happens when Erdogan can't pay? Do those people get released? Do those people get sent to Greece? Do those people, you know, go to Albania or something or just, you know, go to Skopje or Macedonia or, you know, do they go to Russia? They go into the fucking gas chambers. Angela Merkel knows this. She, she did it knowingly, knowing, knowing the history of her own country. She knows what putting people behind barbed wire is going to do. They are there while Europe can pay 400 euros a head per month. Telling you this now, comes the financial great reset. Europe will not be able to afford this privatized prison business that it's in. And Erdogan is going to use these people for dog's meat. He can't release them. He can't feed them. What do you think is going to happen to them? So now, if you think that this is something in the Middle East that doesn't concern you, no. It's the forerunner of you. You are seeing in slow motion what's going to happen to you in London, New York, Paris, Munich. <laughs> Look, people, there are 7.8 billion people on this planet. 220,000 surplus net every day is added. Elon Musk says, oh, no, the biggest crisis is that we, you know, we don't have the fertility and uh, we're not going to have enough people. Look. 220,000 people, net increase per day. That's surplus. You tell me where this ends up, okay? <laughs> and you think you're going to, just because you're a house slave, you, you're okay? The house is going to burn down, damn it. Whoa. Learn to work the system. The system needs to come down. <laughs> okay, well, that's probably enough for, for today. Yeah. But anyway, Thanks. all of this has been under the rubric of surviving the flippening. 
Step one of surviving the flipping is survive the collapse of the global industrial system. And, and I'm, I'll, I'll put this all in the manifesto and I'm working on the manifesto and I'm sorry, but there's so many distractions. There's this, apparently this disease going around the world and it's distracting, but I am working on it and I will get to the, the thing. But in the meantime, um, on, on XR Med, and stuff that, that suddenly we're getting a bit more exposure. There are a lot more bots and a lot more trolls. And um, it it means that, uh, yeah, um, so so can you try and um, publicize XRMed, try and get members on XRMed so we can get to a thousand people? Because I'm saying if we can, if we can get to a thousand members on XRMed, then we can pack it in Forget about XR, wave goodbye to XR and, and move on to the extinction RD sub. Um, oh, and, you, uh, know. you know, I just say let's let's get to a thousand mem members by working together by hook and break. Let's get to a thousand. Um, it, it, it's 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 getting a little weird on XR made because there's uh, you know, we've kind of been noted. Um, so you know, you, you're getting a lot of shitheads and people with you know lots of digits behind their names and stuff which you know are bots and you know state agents stuff like that so so let's just get up to a thousand members and let's get out of dodge and then we can just we can just leave xr med as for archaeological purposes and um and and move on to the to the next phase anyway don't forget that on tuesday it is the new year, the real new year, not the Gregorian shit. <laughs> it's, uh, don't forget to uh, do something with the sigil and take a, take a movie of it and then post it on XR Med the next day. Just, just upload it so we can all enjoy what you did. And yeah, um, happy new year. <laughs> oh, I have, a, I have a quick suggestion that I actually thought of a couple of days ago so you know the 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 um symbol right the extinction audi symbol we should make like posters and then have like a qr code put in the very center of the axle you know you know what i'm saying that, that links to the flipping website the, 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 the other way the other way around actually you can put um you can put a an image in the middle of a qr code rather than oh, the other way around. that's good yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah, I don't the, know how to do the that. QR but... code allows for a, an image in the middle. Yeah, uh, oh, just you just cool. find a QR code or anything. You can put image in the middle, and then yeah, it's um. Yeah, that'd be cool. Then and, we can and you use can, those you as... can have anything you you like in the text of the <coughs> of the QR code. You can have a <coughs> you can have words or URL, anything. But it, generally, it's a URL. Um, yeah, because that, that'd be pretty good because that symbol, people would be like, what the fuck does this mean? And they'll probably want to scan it. Just like putting, you know, just a weird esoteric symbol out there might just, you know, capture their imaginations as propaganda posters. Yeah, so you know? this is what I want to do in the, in the next phase. What, what I'm hoping is, you see, what this is the way I'm thinking, is the manifesto lets everybody know what, what we're all about for, for the first time without any rules. Um, and so then then we'll be able to do things like QR codes pointing to the manifesto. Um, and then you can put the QR code on all sorts of things. You can um, put it on, you know, provocative posters, on shit that, uh, you know, gets people animated and excited and, uh, you know, outrageous things. And, you know, I, I want to take it into the metaverse, right? So, so one of the things I'm, I'm I think the metaverse we should get into when when Zach comes, it'll be absolute pain. It'll be worse than social media, but but it's such an opportunity because it's uh, you see, I think that Zach's uh, Zach's priests won't be able to keep up with the innovation. So, in other words, I'm sure they will try and make it all safe, but I, I don't think that you know it's kind of like a a, a moving battlefield, and so they won't. They won't have thought of everything, and we there will be plenty of opportunities for us because you know that they won't have stopped you putting QR. You for sure you'll be able to upload images, 
then they'll try and do shit where they try and you know censor the images and stuff but it, it's so subtle Did you, i'm sure they didn't think of you putting qr codes on shit and stuff like that or putting provocative objects and stuff like that so i think uh you know it's 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 a very fertile ground for subversion and recruitment and so yeah well for a while i mean uh, I, I think the fate of the metaverse is i think it's the end of zuck I think I think it'll be the, it'll it'll have some novelty value, but like I think that's the end of it. And I think he's uh, he's finished after this. It'll be very unpopular soon. Um, so so anyway, but for a brief time, it's a recruit, recruiting vehicle, and I think now we must start popularizing and spreading the word about the flipping. And so so this is what we'll do. But anyway, I kind of feel like it's on me to do the. The manifesto first and then we can use that to point everything else to and then then we change gears and start trying to popularize this yeah that sounds good yeah um the qr codes are fun like i've done the xr med ones um i've been like a pied piper where i work because i clean a school and i put you know the qr codes in binders and stuff i'm not going to say you know for whom but yeah <laughs> I've been a Pied Piper all these and, years. Uh, and, yeah, I've, I've put them in library books and all sorts of things. But the the thing is, if you find somebody else's QR code, and you make often they they're the same size, uh, and then you you know you ha have them around Greece for like monuments and stuff, and so you get thousands of tourists all like there's a little QR code on the you know on the sign explaining the monument or something and everybody goes and like oh more information <laughs> and then you're like what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can always go and put a, a sticker over over those kind of things and uh yeah we must start doing doing much more of that because uh, yeah anywhere where people might might scan a qr code but the, up until now uh all the, the things just pointed to say alien script and it's all been um obfuscated and so now if they say like okay we forget the obfuscation we just go <laughs> flat out and just just point people to straight to the manifesto so they they go what the fuck <laughs> exactly so, <laughs> it's like no no more subtlety the subtlety didn't work i was i was a bit naive i thought subtle <laughs> But nobody has any curiosity anymore, and the internet doesn't do subtle. So it's like, yeah. move with yeah, the times. Subtlety is probably gone. Yeah, as somebody, as somebody does art, I definitely understand that subtlety is dead. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I, was a bit, I was a bit behind there, but I'm, I'm learning. It's like, it's like no, no one does, you know, the, it's... it's it's like it has all the subtlety and nuance of a disco. This uh, the current side guys. Yeah, it, it destroyed people's either ability to like uh, interpret things or it's just their curiosity in general. I don't know. I don't know exactly, but it's just it's depressing. Yeah, this you can't get subtle in a soundbite. Every everything's got to be a tweet, soundbite, a snippet. It's like. It's uh, utterly fragmented psychological and intellectual landscape. So the, the dialogue is, is, is cut. Everything snap, snap, snap. You know, Snapchat is, is, is perfect. It's, everything is a snap. But, it, but yeah, so, okay, we've got to play with that. And so we, we are like, snap, whack. <laughs> it's basically, you, basically you, you have to hit people between the eyes now, I think, with... Um, if, if you get a gap so just in in 15 seconds you have to hit people between the eyes it's it's kind of a feeding frenzy it's it's where say the dot com got to or any kind of gold rush and stuff eventually you have to give a you know five minute elevator pitch and then a two minute elevator pitch and then a 30 second eventually you know you can only launch a an idea in dot com if it, if you can fit it into one sentence and you know punch people <laughs> i think we're getting close to that so anyway, I, I, you know, all the good stuff is in the subtlety. So I hope that, you know, once we get people on the hook, we can start leading them out of the dungeon and, uh, 
out of the cages and starts uh, explaining to them, take them to the boring stuff and get, you know, get them acclimatized to, to hearing again, hearing, feeling, sensing, get them back to the real stuff. So anyway, in, in the unreal world, everything is a sound bite. And so it's like, we've got to go with that and then get people back to the real world. Anyway, just talking about the real, let's get in. A, anybody want to say anything more? And then otherwise we just pause and end. Booga booga monkey revolution. <laughs> well, monkey world is real world, right? So it's like, get to I just, uh, just quickly talking about putting things in library books i was reminded of uh it's very old school joe joe orton and keith halliwell were a couple of writers back in the uk in the 60s i think you might have heard of them and their library books have you yeah yeah, yeah. it's absolutely it's priceless they, they, got, that, they got sent down for that they did they did didn't they ever that, that. that but they got tricked uh because uh, somebody tricked them. Uh, that, that's really funny. You know what that that mm. that, that was called? Uh, prick, prick up my ears. That was what prick, Joe Orton wrote. Prick up your yeah. Prick up your ears. Yeah, your ears. R e i r s. Really, really <laughs> funny for our times, right? Isn't isn't that apropos for our times? <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't help <laughs> thinking about it while while you were talking. You know, I thought, oh wow, it's just perfect. But uh, yeah, anyone who hasn't seen pictures of the library books, they're online. You can just just Google Joe Orton library books. You you see them. Uh, at the, they were just masters at it. They were just so, and it was just absolute sarcasm, wit, irony, and some of it, you know, you would miss it if you did if you didn't. You think, oh yeah, it's a cover of the book, and then if you look twice and think, oh, that's not right. <laughs> Absolutely incredible, oh, yeah. it was. It's anyway. Spoiler alert, the Joe Orton story is a very sad one. It is, yeah, but, yeah. yeah it, it's basically um, the, these guys he was are murdered by the gay, uh, anarchists, yeah. gay anarchists in London, and it's a very cool story. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Very tragic. Um, you know, I mean, they were both um, highly intelligent people, um, but, you know, I, I think, Damaged, but damaged in their ways too, I suppose, you know. Could you link uh, me their work, Gary, when you get time? Or anyone link me their work? Sure, I, 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 I will. Yeah, okay. I'll, uh, I'll cool, I appreciate it. that. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So if you send it in an email, I'll put it on the, I'll put it in the link under the video. I, I'll see what I can find, yeah. Yeah, I, I just uh, look for something to do with the books and the rest of it's easy enough to find, you know. Well, it'll be, right. the, they'll be on Wikipedia. Okay. Well, okay, well then let's end it off. And uh, the quickest and easiest way to get back to the real is to just do this exercise. Just fall still, close your eyes, feel the weight on the chair, feel clothes on your skin, feel the air on your face and neck. Release all the tension in any muscle all of that tension is based on the unreal. Yeah. Chances are there are no T-Rexes in the room with you and there are no leopards about to leap. It's all the unreal in your imagination. And in the real, you can hear the silence. You can connect with your sense of taste, smell. And come to a point of stillness. And coming out of the real and back to the unreal, we say, Om Paramatmane Nama Iti. Okay. Thanks, you. Happy Thanks New Year, much. everybody. Okay. All right. I look Happy forward to Tuesday. Bye. See you. All right. Bye. See you in a little care. bit.